Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. My name is Guru Nishan, and I'm your host. I started this podcast because I was born and raised in the 3HO community, and I have several intentions for why I felt like this podcast is important. So I read them at the beginning of every episode. Number one, to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or who have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying, gaslighting, or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural misappropriation and exploitation that per perpetuates the teachings, 3HO lifestyle and overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. Number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy and other therapy or other support as needed, draw your own conclusions and be critical thinkers rather than just blindly follow anyone. Remember that your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. If you'd like to support this broadcast, you can make a donation at gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations. I wanna to welcome today's guest. His name is Mani Nile, formerly Mani Singh Khalsa, 1972 to 1985. He was introduced to 3HO at the age of 12 when he attended the wedding of his sister at the Mendocino, California solstice. He moved into an ashram at the age of 15 in Sedona, Arizona, as well as lived in other ashrams in Cave Creek, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Salem, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and then Los Angeles from 1979 until 1985 when he left 3HO in 1985. Mani has been a baker, private chef, two-time bakery owner and operator, and chief cupcake froster, has written four cookbooks and currently resides in Oakland, California, working as an advisor to small food businesses. Monty is also my uncle by marriage. So I want to just shout out to my uncle Monty. Thank you for being on our podcast. I think you're muted. So please unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, apparently this is my first Zoom call. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Gurnishan, thank you for that intro. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of aunties and uncles running around 3HO, but we're actually uh, related by marriage. So um, I'm so proud of you. And I've been so supportive of this podcast from the beginning. I've been, we've been trying to figure out the right timing. And the thing that you just said that uh, honoring that part of us that's been forgotten or silenced. Yes. Like I could just, yeah. I could just go down a rabbit hole with that because that's honestly, that's one of the only reasons that I want to even participate because there was such depth and value to 
to aspects of being in the 3HO family. Mm -hmm. But it, I was so fully shut out at a certain age and we'll get into all that. And to go back there and just get in touch with that. And it's amazing, you know, between your work, obviously Pamela's book and, and Suzanne's monitoring of the Golden Cage page. And to get in touch with glimpses of that and people has been so rewarding. And the other side of that rewarding is the pain. Yeah. And the processes that people have suffered from. And that's that duality that we have to, some of us have to live with. Some people just want it all to be done and go away. But many of us have that duality of the beauty and the pain. And so it's that darkness that's been silenced. So thank you for so beautifully delineating those concepts. Yeah. And, and thank you for being willing to revisit these places in yourself. I know that since the opening of all of this last year, um, and the, you know, the, the beyond the, what's the official name? Beyond, beyond the cage, beyond the cage Facebook group, um, which was originally kind of the forum that, that everything was kind of opening up and sharing. There was a lot of, um, revealing that took place back like March, April, May in this group in 2020. And I know you specifically had spoken to me and, and in general about like, wow, I didn't even know I felt these things. I had tucked them away so far away. Yeah, I know. It was about a year ago, a month or two from now when we were in Arizona, as we gather every year, we went on a hike and, and we always, that stuff always comes up and we share it. And it's like, yeah, I didn't know how much I would, I mean, I'm fair, I'm fairly aware. I have a really good memory, but I had no idea the little nooks and crannies of this stuff. And of course, other people's stories come out and then that you go down another rabbit hole and realize things about your own past and your own experience. So yeah, we were sharing that on a hike out in, uh, you know, um, whatever that part of Arizona where your brother lives. Yeah, maybe you're in Scottsdale. <laughs> Scottsdale, but up in the mountains. And we were talking about that and then we've all been in lockdown for a year, but uh, yeah, a lot has happened since then. And uh, I don't know if you want to ask questions or if you want me to well, just- What I wanted to say questions. was that I know I read the write-up that you wrote in the, that you put into the Facebook group, the Beyond the Cage Facebook group that has been very supportive of a lot of people that have been processing. But one of my intentions for this podcast is to bring a lot of those testimonies that brought were, were in this private group and make them available in a public forum for people to listen to at a future time or whenever, or anybody who gets involved in Kundalini Yoga going forward knows that there's more stories here that might not be being told in your teacher training. So what I want to ask you about that is... Um, I know when I reached out to you for the podcast initially, it was like, no, I don't know if I want to do that again because I shared that, you yeah. know? And so why do you feel it's important to share your story on this platform? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, ultimately, I wanted to just be able to tell my own story and experience and, and share a few other people's stories that I've checked with and gotten their permission or people I had experiences with that I have no interest in checking with them, but I'm going to tell our, our interaction just to get it unedited out there, just to get my unedited story out there for people's, whether they're interested or not. And hopefully to reach the, the people within the, you know, current 3HO community, especially I'm interested in that and having them hear it directly if they maybe didn't participate in a call or they're not on a page, but also people that are interested in, and again, just to get it out there, just to get my story out there. Um, you know, Pamela's book was such a touchstone and it was very macro. You know, it's like she was a big personality. She did a lot. She, she, she carved out a huge niche for herself in 3HO from, you know, uh, translating the Peace Lagoon to starting, you know, um, the solstices and the Peace uh, the Beads of Truth. She did so much. And, you know, my role within 3HO, I mean, I worked at a restaurant, you know, so but when I recognize the machinations and the political maneuverings of Yogi Budget in her book, they so matched my much smaller story mm. that it's like everything about how she described his behavior in that book matched my experience of his behavior. Mm. You know, there's just such a truth there. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to participate because of the kids. I mean, when I read, hear the stories, of what people experienced in, in India, it just breaks my heart wide open, you know? Um, 
And then when I get, you know, kind of jumping back to Pamela's book, but, you know, there's certain things that ultimately happen between several people in a room. And if we weren't there, we don't know. So what I want to talk about is a lot of what happened right out in the open, because so much happened. So many, you know, marriages, Yogi Bhajan cursing anyone that dared to leave, sending kids to marry someone when they're 18, working for a business, you're going to make a lot of money for me and the family and everyone around them and all the staff seeing some 18 year old having to go work for a company and they build the company up for three years and then their thanks is they're fired, they're moved to another business, no commissions paid, like so much happened right out in the open. So while we don't know ultimately maybe what, ha maybe what happened between Yogi Bhajan and another individual in a room, again, it's the behavior, it's the pattern. And when we see what so much that we put people willfully, willfully ignored yes. happening right in front of them, and then, of course, the last section for me to want to participate is to just kind of set the record straight on the early years, anyway, of treatment of LGBT people within the organization, because there were many of us and we didn't know. Many of us didn't know we were in our own form of denial. Um, I heard, you know, Bhagwan's uh, or Rose Diana call said the other day and she said you know most of my friends in the early days in 3HO were gay and I was like yeah most of mine were too but none of us knew it <laughs> <laughs> there was this whole gay mafia but we were closeted even to ourselves. yes know? Actually, I shouldn't say that but there were enough significant people that like yeah their story should be told and I've checked with several of them and I'm, I'd love to recount some of the experiences they've shared maybe on private calls just to put it out there. So those, those are kind of my, my big four reasons for wanting to participate and support your effort and anybody who is interested in this information. Thank you. Uh, I think you just bring up all magnificent points. Um, so I want to let you just get right into it because you, you're a storyteller and, and you sure. have a lot of stories to share yeah. with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I do want to just highlight the point that you made around there is so much that happened wide open in front of everybody all the time. And that because it happened so often, it just was normalized and it happened for so long. Yeah. I think that was a really good point. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure when we finish tonight, I'll be like, oh, there's 20 more things that I wish I had said. And we could talk for three hours, but I'm sure we both don't wanna talk for three hours or we will next time we see each other. But um, so yeah, to start with um, your introduction. Yeah, I, um, I went to summer solstice 1972. I was 12, you know, um, I went for my sister's wedding. I went to Mendocino and it was like going to Middle Earth. You know, I mean, it was magical to me. You know, I mean, we flew down. We were, we were living in Michigan with my family at the time. We were in Idaho. Karin calls us and we're like, I'm getting married in a couple of days. So me and my mom fly down. And first of all, it's the golden hills of Northern California in summer. There's little kids with long hair. Now, I couldn't yet grow my hair long. It was a point of contention between me and my parents. And here's little kids with long hair. And here's, you know, people in tents and here's this gelatinous green gooey food that looks disgusting. And I take one bite and I'm like my first time tasting garlic, onions, ginger, turmeric, like, you know what I mean? Like I'm living in bologna sandwiches in the Midwest and I taste this food. I still remember it, you know? So, so I had a very magical experience going down to solstice again, but I was 12 years old, right? Like if everyone in 3HO went to Woodstock, well, I was nine when Woodstock happened, you know, but this planted a seed. I was a fairly precocious kid, socially, uh, pop culture, you know, um, I was aware of Woodstock, although it was just something I probably read about in Mad Magazine <laughs> or Life Magazine. But, you know, so I go to Solstice, I get this taste. I'll never, I'll never forget these two little long haired kids spilled a jar of honey in this dashboard of someone's truck and the mom's response was oh the poor dears they must have been so bored now you can either see that as horrendous boundary setting and par parenting or kids that are free you know i don't know but i just i just found you know the adults and the food and the hills like i went i went back to life in michigan in the midwest with this seed planted you know that there was this magical you know and it, it didn't hurt that you know 3ho they weren't separatists right my sister's first husband's family had a cabin a few doors down from our family cabin in Idaho. So they came back, you know, and they cooked this amazing food. And, my, you know, my parents were more or less accepting because they were still themselves. They were just doing this weird thing, right? 
to them, I mean. Um, so I go back to high, junior high and high school and I make some fairly bad decisions. You know? <laughs> um, I was not um, highly motivated scholastic. I was really smart in like seventh or eighth grade and got on the honor roll. And then I just decided, I, I want a different life. And I just kind of dropped out and hung out with the kids that were like messing up, screwing up. And I got involved with drugs and drinking and all this stuff. And things were going not well. And, you know, my sister and her first husband were a presence in my life and they'd send letters. Well, one summer they came back to visit us. Summer of 1975, it was after 10th grade. And my mom and I decided, and we got their permission that I would go visit them for a month, for the month of August before 11th grade started. So, I hatched a plan <laughs> and that plan was, I was not going back to Michigan. I intrinsically knew I wouldn't be able to change and I, my friends and I mean, there was some really dead end stuff going on. I mean, Michigan in the seventies and the Midwest and the drugs, amount of drugs in school and the kind of dead end, like it was not hippies with idealism. It was partying and dead end and just, it was not good. So. Fortunately, things worked out. I went to stay with my sister and her first husband. They had an ashram in Sedona. It was just the two of them, but they, you know, they had lived in Phoenix. And so I, I, I moved in. I, it, it all fell into place. I discovered this amazing boarding school that I was able to go to. My parents had saved enough money for college that I was able to go as a day student. And this is another, like, let's put a flag here. When I hear the stories about the kids in India and I think about Verde Valley School near Sedona, I mean, it was amazing. They, you know, it was college prep. You had to take math and science and all this stuff, but there were amazing art studios and you could have sports like, you know, horseback riding. I had hiking was my sport as a senior year, you know? Um, I cooked a vegetarian meal for the whole school one day, you know? It was a phenomenal experience. So it just kills me when I hear yeah. What a lot of the kids went through kids that you know so people started coming up to Sedona from the Phoenix ashram and that was my first introduction you know I remember Himmet and Sarvarta I remember Gurjeet and Fateh and Sita and to me they were all enlightened beings I mean I was that impressionable kid any anybody over 25 or whatever in their 20s with these names like they were already enlightened in my book you know so I had this very idealistic vision of everyone yeah. um, and I also kind of eased into it. Like I was just a teenager visiting his sister, but I started getting up, you know, and they didn't get up at 3.30 and take a cold shower. We probably started sodden around five, you know? Um, you know, so I, I just started getting up and doing yoga with them, you know? And, you know, I did the thing as some, I hear on every one of your podcasts, well, I read Be Here Now, an autobiography of a yogi. <laughs> autobiography of a yogi is the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> It's the book that tells you you're seeking a master and that master is always a he and he holds all the power and you better obey him. Now, maybe Paramahansa Yogananda was enlightened and didn't abuse that trust, but like, oh my God, everybody that talks about how they got into 3HO read that book. Mm. And you read that book? I read that book. I read Siddhartha. I read Be Here Now. I started reading Beads of Truth. You know, so when I'd see these people in real life where they'd come up to the ashram or, you know, Baba Don came up and he like chanted before dinner, I'm so hung, I'm so hungry. Like he had fun with it. And I'm sure there'd people be twisting in their, you know, churidas, like, oh my God, that's a sacred mantra. But to me, it was just like, oh, he, they're showing that this is fun. You can be spiritual, but it's fun. And of course he was, you know, on his way out the door back then. <laughs> You know, but so I had this, I eased into 3-H over the next two years. I went to this really cool supportive high school. You know, it wasn't, you know, Haring taught yoga out there as one of the sports, you know. So it was a fairly tolerant, accepting environment. And I slowly eased into 3-H. By my senior year, my summer after my 11th grade, I went to Solstice in the Pecos. I marched up to Yogi Bhajan with my name on a piece of paper, my, where you were born, the time zone, the time of day. And he writes down Mani Singh and I can't read it. His ends are not rounded. They're like pointed and it looks like a U. And I remember I went to Sita and I was like, I think my name's Moe Singh. Well, first of all, they had said, find out what your name means. And he goes, master of the mind, creator of everything. You must master the mind or it will master you. <laughs> Good words, right? Like everybody could learn from that. But then I couldn't figure out how to pronounce it. So I went to the Baisab and he knew, oh, Money Singh and Money Singh's a great saint and blah, blah, blah. So so I was like, oh, cool. You know, so I, I, I figured out what my name was. I got the meaning. I go back to high school. Now I'm wearing a turban 
I didn't go by Singh Khalsa, but I told everyone my name was Mani and everybody rolled with it, you know? So I had it, I wasn't like somebody who one day is like working at their job and a week later they move in an ashram. I didn't have that abrupt. Mm -hmm. so I got to kind of ease in, right? So, um, so yeah, so I finished high school and by the time I finished high school, oh, so my second solstice, that's when we had the land, right? Rondas, so my, the Rondas Puri yeah. land? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, let's go back to Solstice 72. I marched up to the stage after the wedding and I took a picture with my Instamatic. So I have a picture of Yogi Bhajan, BBG, Papa G, Ramdas Singh from LA, Santok Singh from Portland, wow. and some unnamed woman that we've never been able to figure out who she is. So I, I had this little image of, I'm like, I'm meditating on this little picture of him. You know, it's still in my scrapbook. I've had that since I'm 12. Now, this is the one when you were at Cutting's wedding, your sister's yeah. wedding, right? Yeah. And, and you went to the following solstice and you got your name. Three, well, three years later. That three was years later. Years. All right. I went eighth, ninth, 10th grade. So, and I went to visit her after solstice. So I went through my 11th grade year. I go to solstice 76 in the Pecos. I get my name. Okay. And then I finished high school. I decide I'm going to go to college. And it's, it's vital that I go to a college where there's an ashram. And we didn't have the money for me to travel around like kids do and go visit colleges and get a sense. Like I had to basically pick it on paper. So I chose Salem, Oregon for, I'm not exactly sure why. But before I go there, we've got the summer ahead of us after high school, right? So we go to Solstice at the land, you know, Rondas Puri. And I, you know, I mean, I was, like I said, I was this kid that was smitten by everything about 3HO, like when I would see Ganga or Satnam Singh or somebody on the stage, like I saw them in the Beads of the Truth, you know, they were like rock stars to me, you know? Mm. Um, you know, and of course I would learn years later that the land, you know, I meet Guru Goon on the, my trip to India in 1978, and, you know, she gave the money for the land. And did she get a plaque in her honor? Did she get, you know, that land has made a lot of money over the years. Like I didn't know, I was completely oblivious to all this, you know, did she get a percentage of that money? I'm being facetious. I know that she didn't, you know, so I just take it all at face value, right? So let me stop you real quick and clarify yeah. when, when you said a few years later, you were in India with Guru Goon, um, you didn't know then that she gave the money. You're saying you only knew now in the last year. No, that no, she I knew when I went in 1978, but I didn't mean you to did. jump ahead. Yeah, Got it. I okay, I was just trying to follow a story. So I do want you to tell that story at the time because yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want Let's people to hear this. Okay. We'll, we'll lead up to that. So somewhere in my senior year, I spent a week at the Tucson Ashram, kind of on spring break. And again, now this is my first, now I've spent a little time in Phoenix and Cave Creek. I think I spent three weeks in Cave Creek the summer after 11th grade, hot as hell. Suri Singh made us meditate into the rising sun. I mean, I'm glad I didn't burn my corneas out, you know. He was a little crazy. Um, I had a really hard time in Cave Creek. I was only there for three weeks. Then this I go is back. before I was born, though, because I was born in Cave Creek. This was summer 1976. Yeah, so that was the year, yeah, the year before. Okay. Yeah. So then I go back to high school and I'm like, oh my God. I am and I'm like, I hated it there. I don't know why I still was so smitten by all this. But then in my senior year, I get us week in the Tucson ashram and it's amazing. It's the classic big ashram. You know, it's like an old sorority or fraternity house. It's right on the edge of the campus, very woven into the community. You know, people dropping in for yoga classes. You know, we went down to movies and art events at the campus. I ended up spending the summer there too. So I went there for a week in the spring. I met Prem, who's my dear friend to this day. I mean, I remember everybody in that ashram, you know. Satnam Singh was very sort of, he came out, he wasn't into Sikhi. He wasn't into Sikhism. He what ashram out, is this? Tucson, you said? This was, yeah, this would, so this would have been spring and summer 77. Okay. He would come out during Japji and look around and then he'd come out after Japji and lead a yoga set. Um, and you know he left a few years later because he clearly was not into the Sikhism thing. But he would lead these amazing yoga sets. Um, there was a you know there was just that little can-do spirit there. I remember so many of the people. Um, I think I worked for. I spent the summer there. They offered me a job. I think they paid me five dollars a day. I didn't have to pay room and board, but I was like, in the morning I helped in the children's program, and at night I worked for this guy who meets and cleaning offices. And I mean there was no food. You know, there was like steamed vegetables and rice, maybe. 
Um, Satnam Singh and his wife had their own refrigerator with a padlock, <laughs> which they had things like tortillas and cottage cheese and avocados. <laughs> and back then, Wheatberry Day was a big thing because the ashrams had no money and nobody ate the wheat berry. They cooked a pot of wheat berries every Monday and nobody ate it. You know, so on Mondays you went out for bean and cheese burritos. So, so then, so I had this weird experience at Cave Creek. Then I had this great experience at Tucson. But you know, I couldn't really live there, right? I knew I had already chosen a college, so I spent the summer there, and then I went up to Salem. Salem was like night and day. Um, they had a natural food distributorship. They had a restaurant, so we had food. <laughs> I think my my food scene was like cinched in that moment. Um, I got there; it was raining. They said, "You want to go to the ashram?" And I said, uh, I'll, "I'll wait till it stops raining." And they all burst out laughing. <laughs> I think I got off at the bus and walked from the bus to the, they had a little Golden Temple restaurant there too. And boy, is it different than Arizona. You know, it's gray and rainy. So, so I lived there. I lived in Salem for a year with the near bows, near the near bows um, and their eldest son Spoon, who's still a good friend and, and his sister I haven't spoken to in years, but I, I adore her. Um, and Kamala Rose, Kamala Rose lived in that ashram, you know. Mm. And Elizabeth Sadu, you know, so let me just put a flag here. Yeah. I didn't know yet that I was the classic, you know, gay man, straight woman. Like I have a friend from second grade that we're that classic, right? Me and Beverly, um, me and Prem in Tucson, me and Elizabeth. Like I was the gay guy who didn't know he was gay that makes friends with straight women because friendships between men and women were frowned upon in 3HO. Oh, interesting. And I'm fairly social and I always made friends with both men and women, but I didn't realize that sort of classic dynamic of the, mm -hmm. the straight woman gay man and that, that those friendships that endure over time. So, so socially, Oregon was awesome. You know, we had food, you know, we didn't have, I told them about the padlock on the refrigerator. They couldn't believe it, you know, cause we had so <laughs> we had a whole room with bins of cashews and basmati rice and lentils you could cook anything you wanted so you know the food scene in Oregon was really different but the ashram was like a cul-de-sac in a, in a you know in a very mid very sort of modern city you know I mean or you know like it was just it didn't have a sense of history to it mm. the way Tucson did yeah. um, we were in a suburban cul-de-sac we weren't interwoven in the community um, people were older than me, most of them were married and they worked and they had professions. Whereas Phoenix was still sort of that scrap or Tucson was that scrappy, let's put on a yoga ashram, people trying to figure stuff out. I was the only student in, this, in the Salem ashram and I didn't connect with the college. It was a bad choice on my part after going to such a great progressive, but also you know college prep school with art program as well as academics. Like I really love my school. I still am in touch with them. My college that I chose was a bad choice. I didn't connect with it. I didn't connect with the people. So it really drew me closer to 3HO. Sure, that makes sense. And so then I did uh, something that was probably stupid, but I, I quit. I didn't, oh, I didn't quit. I barely made it through the year, but um, by the end of the year, I knew I wasn't going to go back. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, what I was going to do, I didn't know. Um, I actually went back to Phoenix for a month because there was no, suddenly there was no work between the restaurant and the natural foods distributorship. There was no work. So, I so you were back. working at the Golden Temple restaurant or well, at the Golden Temple store? Well, kind of both. They didn't have a store. They had a distributorship. I was going to school. Uh, at lunchtime, I would go over to the restaurant, which is a couple blocks from the, the college campus. I would wash all the dishes and then they'd feed me lunch. And, you know, they'd pay me whatever minimum wage was. So I'd go over there, eat lunch, cook, di wash dishes for an hour and a half and, you know, and gather a paycheck, sure. you know, a week or whatever. Um, then occasionally when they needed help at the distributorship, I'd go there, but not that often. You know, they had a full-time crew there, Sikhs and non-Sikhs. Um, and then and I because actually, you're a student, you're a yoga student and you're a college student, you don't have as much time. So you're just kind of thrown in where you can. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and here's the other thing is as soon as I got to Oregon, they're like, oh, you should teach a class at the at, at Willamette. I was like, oh, OK. So I put up a sign and boom, I'm teaching yoga. OK. So I think about all these people that pay thousands now for right. their certificate and their renewal. And their. it's like, no, if you had a turban on and somebody gave you a yoga manual, boom, you're good to go. You know, 
Yeah, before you mean before like full KRI establishment yeah. and cheaper yeah. training. Sure. Right. Yeah. So I was I was teaching the class, and one or two of my students came to tantric when there was tantric in Eugene. I felt so cool, you know. Proud <laughs> that you could like bring them in along yeah, the way. Bring them into the yeah. Yeah. I, it, I remember it was so weird because, you know, most yoga, you don't co close your eyes. In kundalini yoga, there was mostly you classes or your eyes were closed. I really like that sense of closing your eyes for an hour. So that's that double whammy. Like, I can't do kundalini yoga at all, like for decades now, like, no. But sometimes I miss that sense of going through a whole class and figuring out the movement with your eyes closed, just being within. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's that dichotomy. Um right. Yeah. Okay, so you said you moved back to Phoenix for a brief time. Brief time, just to work at the Golden Temple to make some money, went to Solstice. But by then I was like, okay, Oregon might be rainy, but this is hot as hell. This is Tempe and, you know, June and July. So went down there to work for Joda for a month or six weeks. They had the I, Golden Temple restaurant in uh, in Phoenix or in uh, Tempe, yeah. right? Okay. They had that and then I went time. back up to Oregon. There was no work in Salem. So I moved to Portland and somehow the Portland ashram had like doubled in size. It had been like three couples and two kids. And all of a sudden a couple guys moved in uh, to go to chiropractic school. Um, Kamala Rose and her husband moved up for his, I don't know, one of, working at uh, Intel or something. And, and so the head of the ashram, I didn't really have any work or money going on. And the head of the ashram noticed that I like to cook. This is Sun Tok Singh that I had taken a picture of at 1972 solstice. Somebody proposed the idea that I be the house paw. Okay. I cook on the days when people, no one else wanted to cook. I made sure everyone did their karma yoga. And for that, I didn't have to pay rent. And he was a jeweler yeah. and he made me a little necklace that I still have. It says house paw in silver. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I met a couple, I mean, Hari Das and Mahan Jiwan, they were some awesome guys there and they were good friends. Um, and then, so, so let, let's, let's take a, let's do, as you say, let's put a little flag in here. Okay. <clears throat> Letters and missives used to go out from international headquarters, right? And since my sister and her ex-husband were ashram heads, they got all those letters. Um, Salem and, and Portland got those letters. I'm sure LA got them, but we were so close to everything. So we would always see these letters. So one letter comes out and I remember reading this and it was from the chancellors and it said, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, all businesses, mortgages, investments, properties, et cetera, et cetera, will heretofore be you know, named under Siri Singh Sub Corporation or Sikh Dharma or such, such and such. What does that say? What does that mean? It meant if you owned a house, started a business, put your money, your parents' money, your investment, your blood, sweat, and tears, your mortgage, whatever it is you're doing, you don't own it anymore. And it's in our name. And this is the way you will do it. ka -ching. Done. So are you saying that that who is the chief that somebody from the headquarters, like the chief heads, were basically requesting that people give their personal property up for collective well, property? No, let me let me clarify, not your personal property. This came up later in the sense of, well, Tej Steiner referred to it with the Toronto ashram. Uh -huh. uh, I heard the same with the Waller Street ashram with businesses. Basically it said, if you're running a business or you have a property in the name in the name of your region, put it in the name of our international headquarters. It didn't mean you have to give your car, but what it in effect did eventually the mortgages that were being paid if the ashram was owned and not rented, it was no longer in the name of sing and car that were- The couple that was actually doing the effort to run that area you're saying. So let's say okay. you're both singing car who are running one area and let's say another group of people, Saki Park, car, whoever the couple were, whoever the people were in any respective area that they should put it under the official organization right. and, yeah. and not, not their own local organization. Right, right. And I mean, I can tell you more about that now, or we can wait till we get to that later. When that, a friend of mine in the, that I meet in India that I run into years later, it had repercussions for her in Amsterdam, where they had put a significant amount of family money 
Um, but we can we can get yeah. To that so later. bring it to yeah. But I want to circle back around to this. This letter, like, oh, it's the family. We're putting it all in this cooperative trust thing for all of our benefit. Blah blah blah. Um, well, another letter that came out said there's going to be a trip to India. And it's like eleven hundred dollars, and it's forty days, six weeks, and it includes airfare, and we'll stay in Navas near, you know, Hari Mandir Sahib. And I read this letter, and I was like, I'm going. Like, I didn't, I didn't have a dime to my name. I was house paw because I couldn't pay rent, but I, I, I'm going. Like, I just knew, right? So, friend of mine in the ashram. A couple days later. He just looks at me and he goes, I know how much you want to go and I have the money and I'm just going to give it to you. And you can pay me back if you can, but if you can't, don't worry about it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I probably paid him back maybe $150 worth, but yeah. So this trip was open to anybody that paid? It yeah, anybody. For that any, it was yes. for yoga students. It was for any yeah. level of people, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was led by Larry Winnick, um, Ram Daskar attended, um, Swami and Sat Nirmal, who became good friends, um, a bunch of other people. So we go like late September, I think late September, early October, 40 days, we got back somewhere in November. Um, so I go and it's just, I melt into it. You know, I just... I mean, first you get off the plane and you've heard so much about India and you've heard so much about this culture. And the first thing you notice is the smell because there's fires everywhere and there's incenses. And there's no you know, filtration on things like we have, like the air stinks, but it also smells like sandalwood and there's gas fumes. And you know, so your first thing, it takes you like two, three days, you feel like you're on Mars. You're like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And the other side of that coin is you go to the Golden Temple and it's just, you know, transcendent. Mm. Mm. And then you start meeting Indian Sikhs. And I don't know what the connection was with the Nahung Singhs, but I, I kind of look now like the Nahung Singhs were like the beatniks or the hippies of the, or they were the punks of the Sikh. You know, I don't mean to de denigrate them at all, but like they were just uber out there. Their energy was compelling, both men and women, you know, the Nahung Singhs. And they also, for whatever reason, for I don't know how long this went on, but there was a connection between them and the American Sikhs. And I really responded to it, just really viscerally, you know. Yeah. And I went to the all night rants by Kirtons and, you know, sitting on top of a bus driving for hours somewhere to go to something. Like I just, you know, and I got sick. I lost like 15 pounds. I mean, I was, I, I went to this homeopathic doctor and he gave me chavan prosh which is like black tar on a chapati and three days later he saw me again and he goes you need antibiotics you know i was so sick but i still had an amazing time you know how old and are you on this trip i'm 19 okay i turned 19 right before the trip now, is yogi bhajan on this trip or is no. this led by a, you said larry so this is it's just led, a different group that's led well, it's supposed to be led by Larry and Ram Dass Carr, but as soon as we get there, Ram Dass Carr gets let off in Delhi and we never see her again until we fly home. She's flying around with, I forget who, um, to perform Kirtan everywhere. Okay, so I'm just more trying to get some perspective on the uh, for the listeners of when a trip like this happens, it's not like an official trip that Yogi Bhajan is taking everybody. It's just a student that decides to lead a yatra of store a yeah. teacher. It was organized from international headquarters. I mean, the letter came out from Sat Simran. This was under definitely under the 3HO auspices. We okay. all went to the group. We all met at the airport in New York, okay. you know, and from there we flew together. So there were about 40 or 50 of us uh, on the plane, which was a trip, doing yoga in the aisles and chanting. And <laughs> I can see it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, and we have a navas like a couple blocks from from the gar from the Golden Temple, and you know there was a meal served uh, every day or twice. We almost never ate at the Golden Temple, which was weird. Hmm. I don't know why. Um, once we got there, there was somewhat of a pro there were gutka classes up on the roof. There were Gurbani Kirtan classes and Gurmukhi classes. You could go to the Golden Temple anytime. And sometimes we'd have side trips, and you pretty much had to go unless somebody was really sick. You pretty much had to go. 
on the trips, you know, on these Kirtans and whatnot, or sometimes we'd go for a couple days, but that was our home base. And, you know, I, just, this is all about honesty and everything, you know, um, you know, Indian men are very affectionate with other men. And I can honestly say, I, I was still not aware that I was gay. Uh, it hadn't permeated deep down in me. I never really had any serious crushes on American Sikh men, but Indian men that want to walk around and hold your hand and chit chat and are very affectionate, like it, it spoke to me. Now I know several guys, purely heterosexual, that really responded. I think a lot of men in society don't have enough affection with each other, but it definitely was awesome to me. <laughs> you know, like you know, because the, the Indian Sikh men were just very open and very genuine and very friendly. And again, they would hold your hand walking down the street. You know. Um, yeah, so that that is just an interesting component of that. But I met Sakar Tarkar, who I would run into years later on that trip. Um, I met Grugun, who by that time it became known. Anybody that was curious enough, like I was fairly aware on that trip that she had donated the money for Ramdas Puri. And my understanding was that her inheritance money. Yeah, and she, you know. According to her, it was an unexpected inheritance from an uncle. She didn't grow up thinking she was going to have money. Um, and I'll, I'll just put a flag here right now. So Larry was the leader of that trip. He was the head of the ashram in DC. Um, he left a couple years later. Like I got to know him a little bit, but he's a fairly aloof guy. Um, Ramda's car kind of disappeared and she's very engaging. She, you know, so Larry was pretty much the de facto leader of that trip. Um, a couple years later, I befriended Larry and he said there were many reasons that he left 3HO, but one of them was Yogi Bhajan's treatment of Guru Goon. Mm. He said, I'm not saying that like, that's why I left. He said, I was, well, he said, Yogi Bhajan was very transparent as to how he was grooming Larry for a, a business role. And he was so open about how poorly he treated people. And Larry was not comfortable with that. And he mm -hmm. said specifically the way he treated Guru Goon and getting the money from her, he just, it didn't sit well with him, you mm -hmm. know? So I'm just putting that there, you know, and Guru Goon, you know, she still had money and she was still a part of the group. And, you know, she was sweet and I loved hanging out with her and I loved hanging out with Sakratar and, and you know, my friend Kartar Singh who left, Sakratar Singh. It was a great trip. The, the outcome of that trip when I got back to Portland, I was like, I really wanted to move to LA. I wanted to be in the heart of everything. That was you the know? takeaway from that. Yeah, from that very yeah, I didn't have work in Portland. I wasn't going back to school. Well, and LA was a hub, right? It was a it was an tantalizing uh, hub. Yeah, I could I could socially connect. I mean, you know, I look back and I'm like, well, how did I end up in Tucson for the summer? I guess I called Joda that one time. How did I end up in Tucson? I guess I called the LA Golden Temple and I got a job as a busboy. So I look back on it, I'm like, yeah, I quit college to become a busboy. <laughs> 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 but you know in ref in in real context though to be fair have a community network that you could go from state to state and get a job and get a place to live and have like a sense of family this is a big deal at this time even now i feel like that's one of the things i've stayed cherishing about the level of relationships and kind of community network that this lifestyle has allowed some of us to have that was the level of magic and wonder that i saw at that first solstice that that yes. continued through that you'd show up in these different cities and of course they'd welcome you for a night or two and if they had work you could have a job and you know um i or even work exchange or you do something yeah. the fact that there's these con community connections all around the world it just yeah. it adds a new level of yeah carring and i even going back to 1975 when we were first going back to uh, Sedona for the summer we were taking a train and we stopped in Kansas City and spent the night at the Kansas City ashram yeah and the heads of the ashram then Kavalya and Padmini we worked at their restaurant for a couple hours and I'm sitting there going oh my god I'm making a chapati you know like it, it was again it was like those for me formative experiences in the kitchen we had you know like a 
eggplant potato pea curry and chapatis. We worked a couple hours at their ashram. They, we spent the night. She said, you know, we could spend the night here and leave a donation, but it'd be really nice to go to their restaurant and work. So I was, I was even though I got in later and I was about 10 years younger than the majority of the people that got in 3HO through the 60s, I always got these little tastes of the early years. And they always had some really warm, welcoming, inviting thing. And, and again, another flag. I look back on that now, like that was us. Totally. That wasn't Yogi Bhajan. That was the heart and soul of the people. Absolutely. Doing the working and the living and the renting, rent paying and the mortgage paying and the cooking and the yoga teaching. That, that was what we created. If we were woven into the community, that was our effort. The people of love. Yeah, with people yeah. coming together in love to live this conscious lifestyle. And um, I, I do really want to point that out because many different episodes has brought up the Golden Temple restaurants. And yeah. if you're noticing the same kind of community formula was happening in many different communities. So there was different businesses spawning and Golden Temple restaurants spawning, but in different cities and different people running it. So there was like this different levels of hierarchy that every city had with different businesses that kind of were run by head couples and then next level couples, which then got more and more centralized as the international group solidified and started taking on the assets. And I often wonder like who put up the money? Like when I first got in the Golden Temple in Santa Fe was still there. You could still buy Golden Temple ice cream all around Arizona. You know, I mean, I know more businesses in LA like Brass Beds and Sunshine Centered Oils and things that have gone away, but like who's trust fund or who, you know, who pulled together to create these businesses back in the day because the vast majority of them didn't last, but a handful of them as we well know, you know, Golden Temple Bakery, Yogi, we're going to hear more stories of some of these coming up. Um, but some of what I heard is it was individuals, say like near Bosing and Carr, started businesses and then they were successful, then, you know, gave them to Yogi Bhajan or 3HO or Sikh Dharma or however that was arranged. And then later on, he, I know after that a business didn't work out, he kept kettle chips. Well, I've, I've, that I've, up. Got great, I've got a great quote on that for later on, but I'm talking okay. about the little businesses like who started making ice cream in in phoenix arizona in the mid 70s and you know and, and i mean it was around for a while anyway so uh, i also okay. want to pause real quick and just say for <laughs> listeners that don't know who guru goon uh, guru goon car um she's the one who donated the money or you know that gave the money or yogi budge and took the money however we describe it um, and just so you know, I'm doing the best I can to bring her on. Um, and if I can't get her on to share her story, because she's remote right now, I'm going to at least read the story that she posted um, so that we can get that story out. Since Ramdas Puri is asset land and it came from an individual, it didn't come from collective earned money. Or nor first from some Hopi prophecy. Like, can we just put that story to rest? Yeah, that can we just put the Hopi story to rest and just say, nope. The money I love was hot. Go, uh, you know, yeah. And Guru Gung goes by Gigi now. So Gigi, correct. Thank you for that. Gigi sure. story. And it was heart wrenching. G yeah. and G. Yeah. It was heart wrenching to read her story. I didn't know that about Ramdas Puri. I used to tell the stories of the enchanted giving wow. of the land because this is the stories that were perpetuated. But when you read and hear her story, you realize, wow, that was quite a myth. And yeah. this land makes a lot of money for the organizations yeah. and, and um, she's living in a trailer, so. Um, okay, so I'm checking my notes. But okay, we so can... you come back from India deciding I want to live in LA. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Tell us so, about that. So I moved to LA, you know, and that's so, so funny. Once you get to LA, you can't move without asking the Siri Singh Sob. But I managed to like finish high school and move to this ashram and move to that ashram and go to this. But once you live in LA, boy, you better not do anything without asking him, you know? That's right. That goes for everybody, all levels of people. Yeah. God, the number of hours of the day he spent controlling and manipulating people. Oh my God. Um, so I moved to LA, you know, and I have a job as a busboy at the Golden Temple. And I'm, you know, I'm sort of socially, con you know, connecting with people and it's a bigger community, but I'm not feeling the juice that I had in Tucson or Oregon. And I'm missing the vibe that I had in, in India. And I think her Dane car was visiting or maybe they, she had moved to LA and I was talking about the Nahungs and Kirtan and stuff. And she goes, oh, you should move to London. 
London ashrams real interwoven with the Indian community. I don't exactly remember making this a big deal, but somehow I must have mentioned it to a few people. I get a call one day. I think I was at Golden Temple Foods. It's Yogi Bhajan. Oh, Sri Singh Sab wants to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. He heard that I wanted to move to London. He goes, my son, I would sooner send you to the moon. First time he'd ever talked to me, except for when he gave me my name. So I'm like, okay, done. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then like a couple months later go by and I'm working at the Golden Temple. And I don't know, they used to have family meal. And I think we transitioned from that to just like people would kind of grab their own lunch at the end of a shift. And, you know, I got to say the early days of Golden Temple restaurants, you hear these, you know, 12 hour shifts and everyone goes home and sleeps three hours and gets up for sadhana. Ours wasn't that. I think I was a busboy from 10 to four. I worked five or six days a week, you know, I punched in on a time clock, but I'm not, you know, it's just a job. It's no big deal. I was getting friendly with some of the people that work there. Well, one day the woman, the kitchen manager starts saying, oh, hey, you want to have lunch at the end of our shift? I'm like, sure. Um, so we have lunch a couple of times. I think one time we go to a movie. One time we went on a picnic after Gurdwara with another couple, not that we're a couple, but with, with, a, with an actual married couple. So I go to work one day and she goes, oh, I told the Siri Singh Sab we're in love. Exactly, that's what I did. Yeah. Totally unknown to me, he is harassing her to marry this guy that she has no interest in, like none whatsoever. So she was playing me to save her from this guy. And I, again, I'm like- You are her is, pawn. Yeah, I'm just thinking this is another female friendship I have in the ashram. Like we're just having lunch after our shift. So again, on the phone, Yogi Bhajan, my son, woman will play you like a cat with a string. Wow. Yeah, again, he's always, so suddenly he's like in my face, nice. Really? Night and day from how he treated most people. After class, he's like, whoa, money sing. Sorry, I don't mean to tease an Indian accent. I mean, don't, no disrespect, but it's hard for me to hear, think about him without hearing his voice. Um, but he wasn't the cajoling in your face kind of person that he was with so many people. He was always kind. And I had no money. I had no white Mercedes. I wasn't the head of an ashram. I had no initials before my name. But people in the odd people in the Sangha take notice, you know, when you notice that he's talking to you, you mean? When you get singled out, suddenly you're a person that matters, like on an aisle, bus boy, you know. <laughs> so for some reason, this girl is not going to keep working at the restaurant, even though most people worked if they were married. So Sada Sat Singh decides, oh, you like to cook, you should be the new kitchen manager. So she trains me for one day with barely veiled disdain at not saving her. And boom, I know how to make five gallon pots of yogi tea and do all the ordering and manage the dry goods section and you make sure the salad bar is filled and make all the tahini dressing and the soups and the stews and the free the budgeons banquet and the bung beans and like boom suddenly the kitchen's mine i mean there were a ton of people that worked there and did the preps but i had to organize it all and do the, all the ordering and get the invoices to the office and blah 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 and i've been in the kitchen ever since so you know so you're saying the lady who was trying to set you up to avoid her own marriage she didn't succeed in marrying you. He continued, Bhajan continued to harass her. She married the guy that she had zero interest in. Interesting. And you got this position into the kitchen. Yeah. So now your love for food is spawning. Well, it wasn't, and it wasn't like it was a coveted position or anything. No, but, no. It's just running it, things. It, and it, it must be so important, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it everything changed. Suddenly... I felt connected. I felt like I had a job that had meaning. My vague, like I used to cook Sunday supper in the Salem ashram. Like I like to cook, like the whole house pot thing. Like I like to cook. It was just a hobby. I don't know if I was any good. I'm sure I put in some weird spices that made no sense in some things, but it was the energy behind it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I start to feel connected. Now there's a couple other things going on then. Before that happened, two of my best friends were Shakti and Siri Gurmukh Singh, Shakti Kaur. And when I was a bus boy, you know, I, I didn't have a car yet either, by the way. My first year I had no car, I always took the bus. About a year into it, my parents gave me $500. I bought an old 
clunker Dotson. So I take the bus home from the Golden Temple and I walk up Airdrome and I'd walk past Shakti and Sirigamuk's apartment. So I'd stop in and they kind of had that Nahung Singh aesthetic that I, you know, they had, I think, gone to India the year before me. You know, and we'd sit around in our kurtas without churni das and, you know, wear, wear our like steel rings and our turbans and, you know, we'd cook and make, black, she made a mean black chole, uh, the black garbanzo beans. And I'd hang out with them and they were good friends, you know. And, you know, Shakti was very aware of what was going on. Like I'm reading, like I'm the person that reads the letter saying your property is now the property of Sikh Dharma and I don't question it. <clears throat> I remember distinctly when they put out a thing where, Monday night class that Yogi Bhajan taught went from $5 to $10. Mm -hmm. And there was no sliding scale by donation, which is common in kind of new agey events. And I remember Shakti heard that and she goes, oh, did the family businesses all give a raise? <laughs> Knowing full well they didn't. You know, and I remember You're thinking- saying there wasn't the donation option and there wasn't- there was no donation option. For people yeah, like, anymore. People were having to pay five or ten dollars to go to classes. It went from five dollars to ten dollars. Now, mind you, this is an era when movies were maybe four or five dollars. Wow. Nineteen eighty, like movies were not this ten twelve dollar proposition. I say movies because it's a good benchmark, but also because seats. You know, we always went to movies, right? <laughs> but I mean, a movie is four bucks, five bucks, but suddenly class is 10 bucks. And Shakti was like, oh yeah, did they give a did they give a raise at the businesses? Yogi Bhajan just gave himself a raise. Mm. He just gave himself a raise. Yeah. Do you question this or do you accept it blindly? And again, Shakti, here's this good friend of mine and she's questioning it and I'm just laughing and I'm like not seeing the sort of digging at the truth behind it. Because unbeknownst to me, she had been in a relationship with this woman, Dave Karen. And again, I've got permission to talk about this. I understand. So this relationship they were in, they voluntarily separated because they really felt like this was their dharma, their path. And they got separated. Dave Karen stayed on the East Coast. Shakti came to the West Coast. They each married men. Well, now. Did he arrange marriages to each of them? Okay, so they were together. He didn't like that. He had both arranged to different men and yeah. then separated onto, okay, thank you. And you can put another flag in the arranged marriage thing. In India, it's a socially adapted custom that's supported socially families. Like I'm sure some people aren't so thrilled about it, but it's it's not this harassment and cajolement. I mean, I'm, sur I'm sure some people aren't happy about their arranged marriage in India, but it wasn't like this manipulative thing like he created it. So, so they each marry men that Yogi Bhajan suggests or whatever, but then Dave Kieran moves out to LA. And I, I knew that they had been a couple. I knew that they were probably back together. I didn't see anything in front of me. They moved from that house that was right on my sort of daily path to another house. The two couples <laughs> move into a house together. No. Yeah. Wow. And I think another friend of mine, Satya, moved in with them for a while because, you know, back then, like two or three bedroom houses were reasonable. Get a few couples together. You could afford really nice houses in the, you know, Pico Robertson area. Well, and let me pause and just say to have multiple couples living in one place is not uncommon. But for us to have the backstory that these women were together and then that wasn't, quote, allowed. And then they both got married off to men. And then those couples are living together adds a whole new meaning here. And, and I bring this up to shine a light <laughs> on my own, like ignorance, stupidity, lack of self-awareness, yeah. you know, because many people knew they had been a couple. There was energy humming around that two of the women in Siri Gurbani, where I was living, were lesbians, although they were married to men. Um, but nobody said it, nobody saw the two of them intimate with each other. And when they decided to leave, it was understood they were leaving together as a couple. But I mean, the day they left, I was over at their house with this woman, Satya, and headquarters is calling and this person's calling. I mean, it was the wild, wild west trying to head them off at the pass. It's like, no, they made their decision. They did everything you asked, it didn't work, and now they wanna go. I can say that now. I couldn't have put that into words then. Sure. I was just watching this whole thing. Like, 
these are my dear friends. I'm gay. They're lesbian. We never talked about it. What? <sighs> now you didn't know you didn't have the self-awareness that you were gay yet, though, at this stage. You know, I knew since I was in seventh grade, but I uh, 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 put it in such a deep little corner of my being that it, it didn't exist. I didn't grow up harassed by people. I it was picked up on by certain people here and there, but I'm not one of those kids that was harassed like a lot of people were. It just it kind of just got sidestepped. So so I watched that go down and it's interesting to me because I look at that period in LA and it's like very quickly after that whole thing happened was when I stepped up into the role as kitchen manager, Gurmuk got sent out from New Mexico, Akasha slowly started coming up as a yoga student and my life changed. And my life from being super tight with Shakti and you know her, her husband, they divorced, he left the ashram <clears throat> and suddenly my whole world got sucked into the, the restaurant. Wow. And again, powerful aura of more strong women. <laughs> right. So, you know, Akash is still my best up to the day. Gurmuk, I've spoken to. We have major differences. Um, but she brought, breathed a breath of fresh air into that restaurant. That restaurant was six years in. The Golden Temple somehow took it over from Help Restaurant. It had been a vegetarian restaurant before that. I mean, it's really hard to revive a restaurant that's been around for 10 years. And she did it. She did it with her energy and beautifying the front of house. Kasha came along with the food and I got caught up in their energy. We started catering. We started doing events. Gurmuk got one customer to pay his meals for a year in advance. And we got rid of the brown vomit carpet. Another customer donated her graphic design services and created a much beautiful menu. You know, it just, the energy changed. Business was up, sales were up, you know, celebrities were coming in. Bob Dylan, William Shatner, Sidney Poitier, uh, Mel Brooks came in, or not Mel Brooks. Oh, the guy that created Dick Van Dyke came in when your sister Pasha was there. Um, Carl Reiner. Yeah, I mean, the place was happening, you know? So just to clarify, we're talking about Gurmuk, the actual big yoga teacher, celebrity yeah. teacher that, you know, hasn't come out and really spoken to any of this. So that's who, right? Who came in yeah. and then yeah. Akasha, who owns the Akasha uh, restaurant in LA. Okay. Yeah. So revitalized, new energy, just upscaled. And what year is this? So this was like 1980. Okay. 1980. I think within a, within a year, 1979, when I moved to LA, within a year, the whole thing went down and I became the kitchen manager. And I think by 1980 or maybe even the end of 79, Gurmuk came along and maybe six months later, Akasha came up. Gurmuk kept talking her up and like, she's never worked at a restaurant. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And she gets there and I meet her and immediately we just click and she like starts revitalizing the food and the energy gets up and, you know, we just, you know, Everything, everything pulls together and the three of us work really tightly together. <clears throat> Sada Sad's the regional business manager. And I think, you know, we have a pretty good relationship. We often, the four of us, or maybe Sada Sad Singh and his wife sometimes go to Sada other Sada restaurants. Are the one running Yoga Borgo in Italy. Okay, yeah. I'm just trying to connect it so that people sure. who hear what we're hearing. So Sada Sad's are a part of the business too. At that time, they're living in LA. They're living in LA. Sadasit Singh is the regional business manager. So he had his foot on, you know, Sunshine Centered Oils, the restaurant. I don't really know what Sadasit Car did, but I know that both of them worked really hard to get out of the restaurant because restaurants are a drag. Okay. And I think they had paid their dues working in restaurants. So they were thrilled somebody that was going to prevent them from ever having to go back to work there. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, they made sure, you know, so that they were thrilled that the three of us were running it. Wow. Um, Lusada said saying he showed up now and then, um, but he was again, he was the Jetadar Saab and he was overseas. Once Gurmuk came on board, he didn't have to be as involved, but he did show up quite a bit. Um, again, and we would socialize, we'd go to restaurants and movies and stuff. Um, we definitely had a love of food together. Akasha, we all went. Gurmukh and Sadasit Singh didn't go, but Akash and I went to Spago when it first opened, you know, Wolfgang Puck, and that was just a legendary restaurant. And that's kind of where, you know, a handful of other people in the ashram went there. Very different vibe and approach to food, but we loved it. Um, Do you know, <clears throat> was Gurmukh uh, a yoga teacher still at this time? Gurmukh was more, no, I think she was more focused. I think she transitioned into teaching yoga after the restaurant. She connected with so many high energy, high level people there. Mm. And her energy was so naturally, you know, I mean, she, well, so I'm just going to put a flag here. 
Sure. Um, we're going to go on to a super famous person that I went in to cook for. Okay. She introduced me to him. I'm not going to mention his name on this podcast because I don't want to muddy the waters. Um, I've been working for the last eight years on a memoir about my time cooking for this very famous person who's going unnamed for now. And I realized if I ever did anything with these writings, I'd have to insert my own life. My first thought was, oh my God, that was a really painful part of my life. Then I realized, yeah, even more reason to write about it. So I've been writing about a book about like my childhood, my time in the ashram and my work with this super famous person. So Gurmukh introduced me to the super famous person. She just connected with customers. Like I tell you, like how she revitalized the front of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, so where are we? We're, we're, we're running the restaurant. Things are going swimming. I love my work, blah, blah, blah. Where, where are we at? How many flags have we planted here? No, no, no. So it's okay. So here you're talking about, she's revitalized. You're, you're, you're in with Akasha and Gurmukh. The restaurant's revitalized. Now what happens? Your friends, your energy is now here instead of with Shakti and... Yeah, yeah well, now Shakti's left and yeah. Siri Gurmukh's left. <clears throat> well, by the way... Huh? Have you been married yet? Okay, so oh, I got to I know where you're married in this span because you right. haven't yet joined my family yet. So keep going. Right. Well, so my sister marries your dad in 1981. Um. So I go to their wedding. I meet you guys. You know. Um. So she has her own son from previous. You know, um, I go to your wedding. Clarification, her first marriage, she had a son, they ended up getting divorced. She ends up marrying my dad who had a previous marriage, several, and they get told to be married. Both of them are now told to be married and you're all for it. You're full in the Dharma. So, you so there's a little story there. Okay, tell us. Yogi Bhajan asked me to go to New Mexico with him to counsel my sister and her first husband. Huh? on my dime, of course. Airfare to New Mexico is like half of my monthly salary. <laughs> From LA. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> He's already there. I fly out there. I'm there for two days. I don't really remember what happened other than, uh, you know, I got asked to fly to New Mexico, blah, blah, blah. But you go because uh, you feel special and he's calling on you? Yes. This the hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, he's like saying kind stuff to me after class. Somebody sent me a recording of I brought cookies to class one night and he's reading the announcement that I brought and he can't read my writing, no surprise there. And he asked me to read it for him or the guy in front of him and you can hear me laughing. Like there was like this camaraderie and this family and the big warm grandfatherly figure. Like there, was, yeah, that was all the things. Like I'm working at a family business. I play Sunday Kirtan with Dr. Wagaru. Like the whole, I'm... I'm Important. Uh, not important, but I'm loving it. I'm connected. It's my family. It's connection, you know. Um, so so I go, I go there, and it kind of comes down that they're not going to stay together. And I don't I don't need to, you know, I their story is not mine to tell. Um she decides she's leaving her husband. The situation with your dad is up in the air. But when Yogi Bhajan decided that he was supportive of that, my attitude changed on a dime. That's how in the palm of his hand I was. Once he decided he was supportive of your dad and my sister, that's all I needed. That's because done. he was supportive, suddenly it was like, okay, that sounds good. He sees something that we don't see. Got it. Clearly. Yeah. So, so. Oh my God. So I'm on that trip. I only went to the ranch once. They fed me. I'm like, oh my God, I'm in the room with him. They feed me. It's time to leave. And I'm sitting there and Hari, he, he's flying back, but none of the staff are with him. So I'm going to fly back just with him on the plane. Um, and I don't remember who's there, but they're figuring out rides. And Hari Har goes, okay, you go with me. You go so-and-so, da-da-da. And Yogi Bhajan looks at her and he goes, what about Money Singh? And she goes, oh, him? We got to give him a ride? And I'm like, you don't even know me. You know, so, so then we get to the airport and she's passing out sandwiches and she gives one to everybody except for me. And Yogi Bhajan again goes, did you offer one to Money Singh? 
And she goes, oh, and she goes and hands me a stamp. And I'm like, not to rag on Hari Har, but it's like, that was kind of the example of the closer you got to him, the more unpleasant the people were. I'm just going to say it. Really? Like that was just a common thing? Whether you were a doctor in LA, a handful of the staff, I remember Narinian is always super warm. I don't need to badmouth anybody, but it was just like the closer you got to him, the more you were like, you're in the castle now and your whole goal is to stay there because everyone wants to, you know, it was not pleasant. The people around him were not fun to be with. Mm. Yeah, so that just always stood out in my mind. Like, you don't know me. Like, I've, is it because I don't have a title in front of my name? Anyway, so we go back to LA. I'm working at the Golden Temple. Next spring or so, Tantric happens, right? So I go to Tantric. And, you know, back then, if you're not married, you just go to Tantric. You find a single woman. Occasionally, if there's two men or two women left over, like, you sit across from someone, but usually it's, you know, there's rows of men and rows of women. If you're not married, unless you were engaged, it wasn't like cool to plan a tantric partner, I don't think. I don't know. So I sit across from this woman and, you know, we don't know each other and she's wearing a turban. She's obviously not a yoga student. She's 19. She's going to college in UCSB. She's from the Valley. She's never lived in an ashram. What is tantric? Saturday and Sunday? So Monday night after class, Krishna either comes up to me or calls me. It was noted. Now, this is when, again, like the minions, the minions going around, getting their nose in your business. Krishna calls me and it was noticed that I did tantric with someone. 45 minutes later, I'm engaged. What? So I'm yeah. at Krishna car in LA. They yep. called black Krishna or pink yep. Krishna. No, not pink Krishna. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. You can ask her how she feels about the word black before her name, but that's another yeah. subject. It is so, another subject and something I would love to talk about if a guest would like to come on and discuss that, that would be great. So honestly, I think Yogi Bhajan didn't ask me, push me, force me, harass me. It was suggested. And I don't think either of us objected. Like that was the criteria for getting married. Neither one of us objected to the other person. Interesting. She was 19 going to college. I was 21 working at the Golden Temple. Now I'd been around 3HO. I knew arranged marriage was the thing. Somehow I kind of vaguely saw it years in my future. I knew, you know, being a householder and the whole thing was the thing. I still didn't, this didn't raise any red flags like, hello, you're not attracted to women. Like I just thought I'm doing all the things. It's going to work out. Did you freeze? Okay. You're sitting so still. <laughs> so I'm just thinking this, you know, to, to me, it's a commitment. It's my word. It's the next step on my growth. And I, you know, I don't want to mention her name again. I don't want to be like Mr. Secretive, but I don't, it's not, I'm not her story to tell, you know, she's moved on. She's had her challenges. We have no ill feeling between us that I'm aware of. We've spoken since then, but I've also been around ashrams and all people, couples in ashrams. And let's just say it was more the exception than the norm for a couple to have affection, romance, sensuality, anything between them. Couples were, it was part of the paradigm of your spiritual growth. And I saw it as that. Interesting. I think she expected us to fall in love and, and romance. And let me tell you, now in my life, yeah, I'm not gonna be with someone if I'm not feeling the feelings, but I just thought as, I saw what was all around me and it was my next step. And I've been thinking about this since this. It's like, I don't know if I was conscious of this at the time, but the fact that Yogi Bhajan didn't have to yell at me, he didn't harass me into a marriage, I think it made me feel special. Like I was more advanced or gifted or I didn't need to be pushed, pro prodded, provoked, all that stuff. Like I was just ready or whatever. Just the suggestion, right? Just a, a mere suggestion yeah. was okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I want to point out that I feel like is significant is just to hear your name, like even like say on that trip from back from New Mexico back to LA. Well, what about money sing? Well, yeah. What about money sing? The fact that you were included, that he spoke to a minion among non minions, for lack of a better explanation. And I really want to kind of emphasize that because. Krishnakar wasn't a minion. She was kind of a head person looking out for like 
who are the people we need to be paying attention to. And I only discovered that later, like in 2009 ish, when I realized, oh, my dad was a regional head. He was an ashram head. She was a regional head, meaning an ashram head how to go to the regional head before they could get to Yogi Bhajan. Yeah. So to understand like the hierarchies of like people were put in charge of, of other ashrams and ashram heads had to go to them before they could actually reach him. For him to speak your name, you're yeah. not an ashram head, you're not a head, you're not a titled person, you're not any of those things. It, there's a level of inclusion. Oh, yeah. That's and it's interesting to me because I saw him be the Saturn teacher harsh, rough, confronting, negative, angry, yelling at many a high profile people. Yes. And he never took that approach with me until later. Um, so but yeah. I had a special feeling taking oh, place. Yes. And I ate that shit up. Okay. I ate that up. Yeah. Okay. Especially yeah. because public shaming was a bit of a norm. Him yelling, him pointing somebody out publicly at any gathering. And I, I, I say that as a child's perspective of normal, but public shaming was kind of a normal thing. And they put it into the category of that's a Saturn approach. He can see things or know things that we can't. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm just pointing that out again, because a lot of these things did happen very publicly. Not everything happened in closed doors. A lot of things happened in group settings, but as a collective, it was taken that he saw beyond what we could see. And that's why nobody spoke, spoke up for anybody in this capacity. Yeah, yeah. And almost everybody that you've spoken to that had a direct relationship with him, there are always moments that they shared where he did say something really insightful yeah. and heartfelt that just got them. And that's the stuff that allows you to kind of see past the other the, stuff. The other stuff, yeah. So, I mean, I, you can tell I'm painting a picture. I don't need to tell too many more stories about, you know, the restaurants thriving, you know. I'm not paying attention to my marriage, but it's it's a commitment. It's over time. It's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be whatever it's going to be, like all the other relationships around us with, again, no disrespect to, to, to my partner at the time. So uh, this is, there's like three or four meetings that happen here and I've lost track of the exact sequence of which they took place. So I'll just start with the big one. Okay. Sadasat tells us we're going to have a meeting with Yogi Bhajan, a restaurant team meeting. And it's me, Akasha, Gurmuk, Sadasat, and Yogi Bhajan's eldest son, who Wait. worked there, who worked there part time while he was going to UCLA or chiropractic school or whatever he was doing. And his eldest son is Rambir. You said that. I uh, <laughs> His you said that. Son is cold beer. His older son is rum beer. Okay. I know that, but you said it. I um, so we have this meeting and he's doing his thing. Like he's harsh to this person. He's nice to this person. I go into this meeting, Mr. Open-hearted, Mr. Like, you know, he's my teacher. This is cool. Um, he gets to me and he looks at me and he goes, so do you want to be a gay? Guess not. You can do it, but you can't do it here. Oh, you will be very good at it. Pew floor out from under me done my groundedness my everything fucking gone whoa yeah just history yeah so i think i denied it as gay as possible like no you know akasha remembers it clearly i've spoken to gramuk she doesn't remember it Sadasat Singh has passed. I would have no willingness to talk to that other person. Um, Akasha is told within a day she can't speak to me. Um, he sends me to two other meetings. And this is the thing, like maybe one of these other meetings happened first, but there's a meeting with my wife at the time and he fucking blasts. And she had a kind of a fear of him. And I was like, oh, he's our teacher. Let's go. Like, he's awesome. And he fucking rips me a new one. Like the first time that the gay meeting, he's not like confrontational. He just says it like, oh, you can be a gay. You can't do it here. The next meeting, he like blasts me and he like totally validates all her fears. So we leave the meeting, me dejected, her flying high. 
And then he sends me to Satkar therapist and good old Hariju and say, no, pause before there. What does he say in your meeting with your wife? I don't remember oh, because. Oh, fair enough. No, just keep going. So then he has the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I don't, it, logically, it doesn't make sense that I went to the meeting with her after the gay meeting because I would have been more fearful. So I don't remember, but Satkar, you know, I don't, she, hopefully she has integrity as a therapist, but this I wasn't. The same Satkar that was brought up in Premka's book. Yes. Got it. Okay. So yeah, you, you just see her as a psychologist, therapist? Only because he tells me to, I wasn't going to go to her. And I, I, are you on the one who was sent to prison or the uh, Jeff guy? That's seems crazy. like if you have the name Hari Jiwan, you're probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So there's two main Hari Jiwans. Yeah. One was the guy that was linked to the gems who still kind of adds, adds his name to this chief protocol. And the yeah. other guy is the one. Who was the, up, 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 up. the Hari Jiwan. Uh, that's called the tone bandit that went to jail not him the one with capital h capital j with the gemstones that calls himself protocol oh that that's the one not a human being i have anything good to say about and not just because of how he treated me at this meeting he was always he was always treated me and other people that i saw despicably unless you had money he actually said to my ex-wife what does your dad do for a living oh he does that oh a jew that doesn't make money I see. You said that publicly in front of people. Like, what does that mean? Wow. Just not so a... you're sent to him and to Sot Car yeah. for counseling yeah. because well, you're gay. I, and I don't, again, I don't remember the order. But I don't remember what Sot Car and I talked about, but I didn't assume that this was private, either of these meetings. Hari Jiwen grilled me on my sex life my masturbatory fantasies, had I ever had sex with a girl in 10th grade before I got in 3HO? I mean, he went right for the juggler and he would not stop. And I just sat there answering his questions because my teacher wanted me to. And it was, ugh, it was gross. It was debilitating, demeaning, fucking, just not pleasant. And I did it. I answered all those questions. And I'm, I guarantee if you're a heterosexual male, even if you're a virgin, you were going to fight for that perception. <laughs> and I did not And I'm sure he went to Yogi Bhajan and said, the guy's gay. And I've heard from other people over the years that he said fag and very, very, very derogatory, vivid, descriptive, bizarre sexual things about me. For what reason? I don't know. I've, I've had several people tell me they heard him vividly querying them about, did they see me do this? Did they see me? Like, just like, what is his problem? Wow. Yeah. Now at this point, you haven't acknowledged to yourself that you're gay. This is just what you're hearing externally from your teacher and it's probably resounding in you things that you haven't processed. Tr what you said is true, but at the same time with that first meeting with him, with the two subsequent meetings with the meeting, uh, the, the, the sessions. Oh, and then the, the third thing, the, another thing happens. His son shows up at work one day and says, oh, by the way, uh, I'm taking over the restaurant. You work for me now. You don't get your catering commissions. I recently looked up my taxes. <laughs> I made four, I made something like $7,000 in 1980 and 12,000 in 1981 because of our catering commissions. And he said, you can work for minimum wage, but you won't get catering commissions. For the department that Akasha and I created from nothing. So you're saying that this meeting with Yogi Bhajan where he calls you out on being gay that was just out of nowhere was essentially for him to let his son come in and take over. So at, you get pulled out of that. Is Gurmukh and Akasha still there when he takes over? Akasha leaves immediately, lasts one day at Sunshine Center Oils and then goes and starts her own catering business. So, and she was pretty dis, uh, like surprised. She's told not to talk to you after that. She's told not to talk to me and then his son takes over the restaurant. So our yeah, little- our like little. Yeah, our little four-year, you know, love space of running the restaurant is done. And she picks up on that right away and doesn't stay. Yeah. But Gurmukh yeah. does. 
Well, when he offered us minimum wage, I was like, well, first of all, I had no idea that you could go to the labor board and say, well, this is illegal, number one. Number two, if I was working 60 hours a week at minimum wage with time and a half, I probably would have actually made more than my salary. <laughs> but I didn't know you could go to a labor board and file a complaint or make your boss, you know, like, I, I don't know who paid, the, you know, Hari Jot from staff came in twice a week to pay the bills and do the payroll. So, so I pretty much, you know, I was a beaten dog at that point. Like I, I moved out from the house I was living with my wife. I started couch surfing. I was a deer in the headlights. I was like, Siri Lomenzo said, I didn't know how to be without the people in that room. That, that was me. That was me. I, I, I didn't know how to be. I, I was just, you know, a handful of people in the ashram gave me part-time work. Um, Peter Alexander gave me work at Ad Express. Swami and Seva Singh at Body Buddy. Like I had, but you know, it's not the same when you've been working a job you love and you're connecting, you know, cause I connected with customers. Sometimes I would host in the evening. Sometimes I would be a waiter. We would do catering. One time we did a catering job for Daskar and I, we had, you know, have to hire people for catering jobs. We went out to the Elizabeth Clare Profit property and we realized it was a lesbian wedding. We like, you know, we had met with the couple, we had done a tasting. We didn't realize it was a lesbian wedding. We just kind of giggled and like, hey, people gotta have a wedding. People gotta eat, right? Like we rolled with it, you know, and we had fun with it. Like, so I've had this job where I'm connected with people and it's creative and I connect with customers and, and all of a sudden, like, you know, you're going to go run errands for somebody or stand at a lathe and put, you know, it just, it wasn't. Well, and I want to flag yeah. the point that it's even more than that. It's that you're being now negatively called out publicly by YB in an area of your sexuality that you haven't yet claimed. Yeah. Can we it take a two minute me. break? Can we take a two minute break? Does that ever happen? Okay, so just to recap, he has called you out publicly. He's brought his son in to take over the restaurant. You've had to have counseling with Hari Jiwan and uh, Sotkar about being gay. And yet you're, you're now feeling lost in your own community. You, you don't have this passionate job that you were enjoying, the community, the relationships. You're being called out by your own te teacher where before you were special and now you're not anything <laughs> thank you very well summarized um yeah no i was pretty much you know i didn't realize it at the time but i mean i was a beaten dog you know i was you know i could have denied it i could have fought for my relationship i could have fought for my place you know i don't know nothing would have happened with the restaurant like that was over you know his son told us point blank you can go complain to my father but he's not going to do anything you know so I, I, hear, I hear that Gurmuk stayed there for a few months later and then eventually they fired her. Yeah. And she still blames that on other people. I'm like, his son manipulated that and he just didn't want to do it himself. He had these other people put up to it. But anyway, that's her life. Um, you know, Akash is not talking to me. I'm, I mean, I'm just, I went to being a dark horse. I just- well, Akash I, I, didn't talk to you after that. For a while, for, yeah, for a while. We, we've very much healed for decades now but no i but but i also you know i just fucking I mean, that's just the way it was if he gave a directive people listened so it's not like that was a betrayal of your friendship it was like the teacher said so what it else was for my growth for her to talk to me yeah yeah so you know so i'm not going to yoga i'm not going to gurdwara i'm not going to sadhana you know i'm i just i'm in shock i i house it for people and I don't give anything and they ask me to leave, you know, then I end up getting this one cushy gig house sitting for this apartment in Beverly Hills. But, you know, but mostly I'm just floating around like I don't have a dime to my name. Interestingly, I didn't know about unemployment and somebody tells me you can file for unemployment. I'm like, really? I didn't never heard of this. So I file for unemployment and I get a call from the Golden Temple and it's, uh, Ram Sarn. Ram Sarn had worked there. Normally, Hari Jote was in the office. She's on staff. 
Ram Sarn apparently has been in that role now with YB's son taking over. She calls me and she goes, well, I got a letter from the Employment Development Department. She goes, you know, technically you quit. So you're not eligible. I said, yeah, well, he told us we wouldn't get paid for our commissions for our work. So I'm supposed to do my day job, all the ordering, cooking, schlepping to an event, serving, bringing it back, like nights and weekends, like I'm supposed to do all that for my, like, how? and she just went, I'm going to approve it. <laughs> wow. And back then you got like 12 weeks. So I got 12 weeks of unemployment checks, you know, before I got some other work. So, you know, it gave me, you know, a teeny bit of a cushion. So obviously I've always been grateful to her and, and, and her daughter is second gen and boy, her daughter's got stories to tell. Um, Who is this you're saying? Darcy. Dar oh, her God. daughter is Darcy. Darcy. You mean the daughter. That was the daughter. Darcy. daughter is Darcy wow. I mean, she was a little girl at the time. And I, I didn't know half the, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know that her mother's ex-husband had been, or, uh, harassed her into the ashram and the ashram had supported him. That One ashram had protected her and another ashram had helped this guy move their belongings out of an apartment to leave them destitute. And the solution within 3HO, even of the people protecting her, was to send her to LA and the daughter to New Mexico. Not reporting the husband to the fucking police. No. This is what heads of ashram saw and the good ones protected the woman from the abusive man, didn't report, report him, and sent the woman thousands of miles away. That was the 3HO virgin family protection. Anyway, I didn't mean to bring that up, but that came up. And this is the kind of stuff I didn't know at the time. And I'm hoping Darcy will come share it because it's such an important story. And she and she knew um, Kate felt. Um, I, I didn't realize that was going to come. But that's the kind of stuff like, so... The, the next few years, it's just, I mean, I'm really in shock for those first nine months, but it's also begins this process of really starting to look what you've just been doing for the last eight. It took me another two years to leave, but it really, you start to do this serious soul searching of who you are, what you're doing, what the goals of the group are and what your goals are. And are they parallel or are they fucking going further and further apart? Because that's what I realized. Mm. You, know? you start to look at what, what did that letter mean? you know, about the property, you know, and you start to think about why was this woman being cajoled into marrying this guy she loathed, you know, why, why did Surya cars, why, you know, I remember Surya Singh from Cave Creek and how challenging he was. When his wife left in LA, she goes to Yogi Bhajan and asks for his blessing. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> it's not going to go well. You know, like how many people, didn't they get sick of hearing him curse? Every woman was going to become a prostitute and every man was going to die in a plane crash and you're all going to start this cycle of 999,000 lifetimes as a cockroach. Like, didn't that get boring? But you know it did it because that happened, <laughs> right? I mean, you're only thinking of these things now that you're kind of in this in-between space of not fully in the community, not fully out of it but starting to think a little more critically than ever before. Yeah. So it did take me two years. And I, I want to pause here and say when I stopped wearing a turban, because I have such admiration for the Sikh religion. I usually refer to the fact that I was in the ashram or in 3HO. I don't say I was a Sikh because I don't want to knock Sikhism in any way. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the really amazing uh, national, you know, uh, you know uh, international religions or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it did take me two more years to stop wearing a turban, you know, seven, eight, nine months, you know, I'm floating around, I'm not seeing people in the community. You know, I ran into one of the ashram heads, wives, and she was compassionate. She asked me how I was, did I need a place to stay? And it was very kind. And I look back on that now and I go, she had one guy in her ashram thrown out for being gay or harassed. Why didn't she fucking march up to Yogi Bhajan and say, what's with throwing out all the gay people? Like, it's one thing to show compassion, but why didn't they march up to YB and say, hey, this is fucking LA in the 80s. Why is it wrong for these people to be a part of our community? Right. You know? So, so about- What you're nine saying is that it was a very public thing that Yogi yeah. Bhajan was taking a stance against gay people and lesbians. Very many people knew that, 
more people than I even were aware of knew of Shakti and Dave Keir's relationship before then when they got together and then they got harassed out. Um, people saw me. If, if I left and people didn't know, like the further I got from LA, the less people knew about it. Sure. But everyone in LA, like I'm sure not everybody heard the story, but I also had people come up to me years later and tell me really vile things that were said about me. Now, he said so many things like, did he say that? Did someone on staff, like how do rumors get started? He made so many edicts that at a certain point, unless you can track it down to one of his lectures, how can you really verify for sure that he said it? Mm -hmm. But just in general, the public kind of public opinion, it was, it was publicly acknowledged that it was not acceptable to be gay or and not. I the strength to just show up at Gurdwara and be proud and be myself. I just, I, I adopted the role of the, the putt or the beaten dog. And I just, I stayed on the periphery, you know? Yeah. So, but like nine months later, I get this great job as a private chef. Like, oh, and I was chanting for this job. Okay. I stopped chanting for, you know, mantras. I was chanting to get this job because it was a catering client that I had nurtured, just someone catering, you know? And so I get this job as a private chef. Oh, and before I go on, before I leave on this tour, Sada Satsang comes up to me. Oh, by the way, if anyone asks, you're not so-and-so's private chef. The Golden Temple is catering the tour. And here's a stack of business cards that identify you as the chef for the Golden Temple. Oh, you mean the uh, Golden Temple so that I've thrown out of fucking no, year? We need more context. Hold on. So you're saying a year or so later, after you get thrown out of the Golden Temple because he publicly admonishes you for being gay, breaks up the clan that's running the group, puts his son in, whatever, yeah. you end up from your nurturing of the clients, getting this private client who takes you on this big tour in the 80s to, yeah. take, to basically be his private chef on this big time celebrity tour. And yeah. Sasat comes up saying, oh, you're not the private chef. Make sure you say publicly, Golden Temple Restaurant is, here's the cards. Make sure you're advertising for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how yeah. do you receive this? Oh, he says, oh, he says a little bit more. Okay. He says, by the way, he trusts you because you're a Sikh. If you mean you, a celebrity. If you stop wearing a turban, he won't trust you anymore. And now you're still wearing a turban, but you're already kind of quite ousted from the community in this in-between space. And he's planting this seed that, oh, by the way, if you take off your turban, this celebrity is not going to trust you. And guess what? It did two things. One thing is I wasn't even thinking about stopping wearing. I was still trying to make everything fit together. Like I, I was like, I didn't know how to be outside of the people in that room. Like I was still, you know, some of your guests have said, like, I didn't know how to exist outside of this group. So I was still trying to make it all make sense. So Sarasat in that one moment said, we don't care about you. We're not your family. We care about how this looks. And it planted a seed that like, you know what? I'm probably gonna, I couldn't have said this at the time, but it's like, they're not my family anymore. And they just told me. Wow. But I wasn't even thinking of that. But so I'm like, but I was damn sure not to, oh, it gets better. A couple of weeks into the tour, my unnamed celebrity boss says, you know, those people at the Golden Temple don't have your back. Ooh. We've known you for two years and they said horrible things about you. And we looked at them and we said, We know Bonnie. We choose Bonnie. Oh my God. So a guy I've been cooking for part-time versus my family. And my family's like, and my occasional clients like, and I never asked him what they said. I, it, and even at the time, I like, this didn't, this didn't add up to anything. I, I didn't know where to put it. I, it, it just didn't match what I believed about my family and Yogi Bhajan and everything. Mm. Yeah. Total cognitive dissonance. So I, yeah. So all I can say is the tour was awesome. I worked so hard. I never spent money. My money went right in the bank. 
you know, a year and a half later, I got $7,000 in the bank. I'm fucking rich, you know, <laughs> you know, um, I remember on the tour, we go back to LA once and guess what? I get called in to see, you know, who, no, when you're on this tour with the celebrity tour, which we almost made it to, I remember we missed our chance to go see it. Um, I made that up for your sister when they got to LA. <laughs> Sorry. I know they, can't, I was just, oh, they freaking canceled the Phoenix concert for some reason. That's why you guys were trying to see it in Chicago or Michigan or Minnesota. Oh my God. Your yeah. sister got to see it. You can live vicariously through her. I did. Um, Read me. So he calls me in to see him. And I didn't realize what a power, I look back on it now, like this was a power exchange and I didn't know it at the time. You're at the end of this, this tour. I almost said the tour. <laughs> you're at the end of this tour and you can you're go wearing a turban. Yeah. You're full on celebrity chef. I yeah. remember how special that was. I got a wallet. Yeah. <laughs> so First, so he's like, how you doing? Like he's checking in with me. He's being all supportive. Back to back now to the call you into the place in LA. Okay. Yeah, and I go. First, somehow I end up telling him I want to write a cookbook. And he goes, Oh, just take Siri Vade's cookbook and put your name on it and your famous boss's name, and you can have all those recipes. Cause in his mind, it's all about him, because that was all his cooking style. Wow. Let's put a flag there. Let's put a flag there. You can say what you want about the bullshit that he did to people. He could pull some yoga sets and some tantric and recipes. Like I do recipe formulations for a living. Now, maybe it's easy to make up a golden milk recipe, but he would say, take two teaspoons of that and a mustard seed and, da -da, and this much ghee and cook it. Da -da, and it works. Like he didn't grow up in a culture that men hung out in the kitchen. Like he could crank out some, now maybe, his students really tested the recipes, but sometimes he'd say, oh, take this, take that, take that, take this. And you do it and you'd be like, yeah, I mean, this is awesome. Like, where did he just come up with this formula? You know? Mm. Anyway, so that that's just one of those things like, you know, he could just tap into some universal flow of information. All right, so let's go back to this meeting. So that's just kind of a casual thing. And then all of a sudden he goes, okay, okay. And he tells his staff, get, get a piece of paper, get a pen and paper. Uh, I want you to write down the 10 things to appear more spiritual. I, I verbatim. I wrote them all down. I threw it away. I remember two of them. I wish I had kept that. That would have been so good. The first one is when you're in a room with your famous boss, stand up and say, I'm going to go meditate now so you can appear more spiritual. Oh no. <laughs> if you knew his entourage, they would have looked at me and been like, fine, go meditate. We don't care. <laughs> it was like, it was so ludicrous. Wow. Yeah. He Did didn't he say, how, you how notes what? Be, giving you notes yeah. to be more spiritual when you're in a room of people, quote, not in the community. Uh, yeah. Here's the, th here's the 10 things to appear more spiritual. I'm like, where's this coming from? Like who perfected the appearing more spiritual? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, I wish I could remember the other eight, but I remember number two. And I'm telling you, by the time I got done writing number two, I was like, I could have been writing like, he is not my teacher. He is not my teacher. You are no longer my, like I knew, by the end of this, I, I knew he, we were done. This meeting was a solidified, like, I'm out of here. He could have been saying, I am not your teacher. You are on your own. But I mean, it was just, so number two was verbatim. On Sunday, go to Gurdwara, whatever city you're in, even if it's an Indian Gurdwara. Wow. Just let that sit a minute, even if. What does that speak to the chatter that's happening about the 3HO sense of superiority, ritualistic people brought up in this religion, no connection, like stated or unstated, that was the vibe. Interesting. Like fundamentalists everywhere. We were the true believers and they were the, you know, yeah. 
And to add to that, we were given the narrative that we have special knowledge that wasn't passed on in India because it wasn't allowed to be. So it's yeah. like a part of that mythological tale. We had special information as Western Sikhs that Indian Sikhs weren't even getting. Right. And that, le- that speaks to that. Yeah. Even if it is, meaning even if it's beyond our special scope of the reality that we were taught. Yeah. So I leave that meeting like, that's it. I'm done. Still had nightmares about him for a few years. That ended at the Singhar Gurdwara. Um, but that's a few years in the future. So, you know, I go back to the tour. I finish cooking for this person for another year or so. And it was time to move on. And I, I was very clear when it was time to cut the hair and not identify as a member of the ashram anymore. And, you know, and then that's when, that's when things really get weird. Mm. Like I moved on and I was clear about it. And, and also I, w- I was like, so done. Honestly, if it weren't for you, my sister, your family, I'd have been like, see ya. <laughs> You know, but I, I was a little judgy early on when my sister was leaving her first husband and I didn't, I didn't want to ever be that person. And I wanted to make sure there was no rift in the family. And I never went around telling people what he said in that meeting. Some of my closest friends never knew, you know, and we just didn't, that wasn't our focus for the people that I connected with years later. We just didn't sit around bitching about what went down, you know. So I was very clear that I wanted to keep that lines of communication open with anyone in the organization that I wanted to stay close to. Because your sister, my stepmom, stayed in the Dharma for another good five or six years, at least, if not longer. And and Akasha started working her way back into my good graces very, very quickly, you know. Okay. Okay. She would repeatedly say what he did to you was effed up. So, you know. so, but the next, you know, but, that, but then over the next few years, like, I mean, I moved on with my life and I don't need to talk about that, but the things that kept popping up, like, you know, first, the last day I was in 3HO, or I'm sorry, the last day I, ch- I was just going to stop wearing a turban the next day, I hung out with this artsy couple, friends of mine on a, a layover in another city. And that was when the lawsuits were coming out. And I, did, I wasn't confrontational, but it came up and they were just like, I don't care. The benefit he gave to my life outweighs any bad that he did. And I also heard that years later from another friend that I was on my India trip with. I saw her at your, your brother's wedding in Española that I'm going to talk about later. People just kept saying, I don't care. It wasn't like they denied it. They were like, I don't care if it happened because the good outweighed the bad for me. That's what they were saying. And just to qualify the um, the... Uh, lawsuits he's talking about is Kate Felt lawsuit and the Premka lawsuit, which, you know, specifically were detailing um, rape, uh, underworking, overworking, right, underpaying, overworking, as well as um, stealing of business proprietary knowledge, all sorts of stuff. And this was public record even at that time. So anybody oh, you're referring to yeah. read it. And then yeah. it's choosing to say it doesn't matter because the benefit is more than what this could possibly have mean. To well, somebody. I was enough connected to the community that I knew it would, they were referred to as the lawsuits. That they were the lawsuits. That's all people. People didn't talk about the content. People didn't look it up. It was just the lawsuits. And you were pretty much expected to denounce them or people would on their own just say, I don't care. What he, he literally saved my life. Like, what were you, a drug addict about to shoot the gun in your head? Like, people would repeatedly say, he saved my life. He literally saved my life. I don't care what else he did, he saved me. And people just, that was, so that was kind of going on. Those lawsuits were just coming about in the first years after I left 3HO. And that, you know, that was not pretty <laughs> to hear, you know. Um, the big one, of course, was a couple years later when you hear about, you know, the FBI breaking into the Herndon ashram and Grujot and the guns and people down on the floor and the pot smuggling and the Grujot's partner who, you know, fled to Canada. I seriously doubt anyone savvy enough. One of your podcasters said that they are 
felt bad for his wife with three kids. And I'm thinking anybody savvy enough to flee to Canada probably made sure there was money to support the, the wife, but that's not my story to tell. Yeah, but the trauma and the drama of that, like breaking into your ashram and the guy goes to jail, like, do you need any more proof of some shit going down? Yeah, and, and let me just qualify and clarify that, you know, every episode that is being explained aren't real, the real actual details of that incident. So when somebody comes on and gives actual details of those specific yeah. incidences, we'll get more of the tapestry that's being laid out. But if I can get clarity from you, you're out of the Dom right now and you hear about those things? Sure. Yeah. At that time, you hear about the LA raids, the LA, because uh, there was raids in LA, there were the raids in Oregon or Washington, and there was also Virginia, and they were somewhat close, but not necessarily all at the same time. Yeah. And but the big one, yeah, and, you know, because I've kept the communication open, I hear about this stuff. Okay. You know, and then by 89, by 1990, I opened a bakery, I opened Monty's Bakery. Um, uh, by the way, again, I took my pronunciation back. Instead of money saying, I pronounced it the way we did before we got all like your mucky specific. I pronounced it Monty and it was Monty's Bakery. And that's how I've made peace with that because I, I like the name. Um, but yeah, you'd hear about this stuff and it's pretty vivid, like the breaking into an ashram and guns drawn and people face down on the floor and children and a guy getting carted off to jail and staying there. You know, you're thinking, well, these rumors have been swirling for years and this is pretty, you know, so I'm hearing that. You're also more critically thinking because you're out of the community at this point. So you're paying attention to the tapestry yeah. happening in yeah. multiple places. Yeah. I also want to say, I'm guessing you're out by the time LA gets raided and they move headquarters from LA to New Mexico, you're already out of the Dharma at this point. Yeah. yeah. You're watching it from the outside in, which it obviously are, lends a larger scope. You're open to more information. Not that I went seeking it out, but you'd, you'd hear. Well, let, let's put a flag in Yogi Bhajan's master manipulation. Because not a lot of people have talked about this, but I think I think one of your last ones did. Shaktipad. Shaktipad, the way he presented it to us was the more enlightened and spiritual growth you have, the more the temptation is going to come towards you. And the closer you get to, and closer you get to what was never defined, enlightenment, breakthrough, chakras, I don't know. But the closer you get to something, the more the temptation to give in to anger and denial and slander. So it was like, basically, if you believe the stuff said about him, you were close to some big breakthrough, but you were giving into Shaktipad. Now I have a friend that's a yogic scholar and he's like, yeah, that's not what Shaktipad is. But that's what we were fed. So we could either give in to believing what we're seeing in front of us, or we could shut up and hope for this major breakthrough. Right. You know? So yeah, but I'm, I'm you know. not in that because I've moved on. So I'm hearing these stories and I'm like, these are troubling. <laughs> and there's looks like there's a lot of substance here. But I'm I wasn't gonna trouble myself. I just, you know. Mm -hmm. So then right, there's so another story. Three in LA. Yeah, so I've got to, yeah, you know, and, and Sikhs come in and sometimes they're doing their mala the whole time, like like their mala is more important than dealing with the, the customer service person that's taking care of them, but whatever. Um, um, one of the big ones for me was, um, so a dear friend of mine, I fell out of touch with because I left and she stayed in, um, and she ends up marrying a guy and his Sikh name is Gurpreet, not the Gurpreet from Seattle. And Gurpreet, it was an arranged marriage. Gurpreet says out loud to a friend of mine, so-and-so is gonna kill me. A few weeks later, Gurpreet is found dead in a trunk. <clears throat> Ganga says to the person that Gurpreet said is gonna kill him, she confronts him verbally after a Gurdwara and my friend is freaked out because she's supposed to be like join 3HO as a refuge. Her sister was in 3HO and she gets married off to this guy who's found dead in the trunk of a car. And I've never 
you know, been able to find out what really happened here. But you're hearing this. And when this happens to a friend of yours, this isn't gossip or rumor. This and I end I end up she she moved on. She left. She changed her name back to her old name. She marries a great guy who happens to be my travel agent back when we had travel agents and I make their wedding cake. So again, I'm not passing on gossip here. I'm not. This happened to a friend of mine. And you're just like, okay, one guy goes to jail. Another guy, apparently the story is he mismanaged a pot delivery through the port of Oakland and he ends up dead in the trunk of a car. And he names the person to someone, oh, so-and-so is gonna kill me and he ends up dead. Like this is mafia shit or this is 3HO? I, I, I just keep hearing these things and I'm like so glad I got out. What you're just saying right now is that Gurpreet actually said so-and-so is gonna kill me, the guy who ends up dead and based on a pot deal and meanwhile we're all being taught not to smoke anything ever <laughs> in our life and there's yeah. pot deals going on in multiple locations yeah it's astounding I mean, that's as much unfortunately i don't know this guy's english name honestly i never brought it up with his ex, well i don't know if it's his widow she moved on she married this guy um, they, you know, I did the cake for their wedding. Awesome guy. Like, I didn't want to bring it up. Like, hey, what really went down? Like, that wasn't, like, you've just lived through this really painful thing. You know, she got in through her sister, Sat Darshan, who for years had been serving Dr. Allen. Let's just talk about that. You know, women who are 16 times more powerful than men. Wow. Yeah, 16 times more powerful cooking, cleaning, and doing the laundry. She was going to UCLA full-time taking care of Dr. Allen, and then YB up and marries Dr. Allen off to a 19-year-old. Well, um, thank God so Darshan moves on, her sister moves on, their dad was a customer at the Golden Temple. I remember giving him our golden turmeric ginger lima bean recipe, Max, really nice guy. He must have been so happy when his daughters got out of that group. <laughs> you know, like talk about two women that gave everything and just got shit on by Yogi Bhajan, you know? So this is happening while you're out of the Dharma, have your bakery people. And why are people coming into your bakery? Because it's the, like one of the first sugar-free bakeries ever. Oh. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we make, qualified. We make Mani's Bakery in the heart of LA, sugar-free yeah. baking. I mean, this is big deal stuff. Four and blocks our from is sugar, right? Yeah. Mainstream. Yeah, four blocks from where the Golden Temple was, which closed like a year before we opened. Such funny karma, you know. And my brother Kieran worked for you, like at sixteen, seventeen ish. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I had a good run there, but the other thing is, oh, people would show up. Pink Krishna showed up. I mean, people after three H O would show up. Livtar, remember? I don't know if you remember Livtar. Her and her husband were sent to Phoenix. You guys were always the problem children. Ironically, you guys always had a Khalsa school and like a Lunger program for the larger. Community. You guys always had this great stuff going on, but the Judgment G three. There was Phoenix was always this like whatever, and so Livtars were sent Wait, to. Because yeah, at, Phoenix has so many things. I'd love to hear more about why it was the problem ashram, but that's so funny. People are gossipy and judgy. Liv Tar showed up and she told me some interesting stories about her life since she let move. Pink Krishna came in and she was a dancer. You know, she was very, held herself like a dancer. And she was often in charge of the back ashram on Proust Road. And I remember she like trying to explain to this girl, we were doing seva after Gurdwara on a Sunday. And she was so like rigid and held in, this girl just burst into tears because Krishna was smiling and saying Sat Nam, but she was conveying anything but and she was trying to explain <laughs> how to clean something and it was so good to see these people after all that and have them you know quote unquote let their hair down and I can't remember the conversations but it was just real sweet to have them show up and want to connect and kind of touch base about their lives since then you know you know but the other the other kind of darker side was like reconnecting with with someone like Michael Whitmer mm -hmm. um, Michael was Maharaj Singh you might have heard him share on a zoom call Okay. He was someone that in 1975, he was working at the Brass Beds. He was married. Uh, his wife was Maharaj Kar. He, I checked with him to share his, the outlines of his story. He was unhappy that the Brass Bed factory was understaffed all the time because people were sent off to do seva for Yogi Bhajan. So he organized a meeting. He like, we're going to organize. We're going to like unionize. We're going to have a meeting. Yogi Bhajan shows up at the meeting. 
basically gets what he wants. So he goes up to Ram Dass Singh afterwards and he goes, why was he at the meeting? And, you, and Ram Dass Singh goes, because he's the major shareholder. So Michael goes, so he's my spiritual teacher and my CEO. And Ram Dass Singh is basically, yeah. And I'm thinking, why didn't we ever ask that at the Golden Temple? We didn't know where the money went. I don't think it was losing money. Nobody was pumping money in to keep it going. It must have been making money when his son took over. Yeah. So Michael Whitmer goes to business school, gets a degree and decides, I want him to be my spiritual teacher, not my CEO. Yeah. So a couple years later, he's in an arranged marriage. They have a good communication, but he ends up discovering that he's gay and he has a couple relationships. And he's honest about it with his wife. So they go to CYB and he goes, I want to talk to you privately. And he goes to Michael, he goes, don't do that again. Recommit to your wife. You're my son, I want you to be here. And he tells her he has to stand up in front of the Sangat, say what he did and apologize and beg for forgiveness. Oh my God. Now, when I read that and I read Pamela's book, I'm like, that's the political machinations, always getting ahead of everyone, telling one person this, another person that, and always leaving him ahead and in control and beholden to him. Right. Yeah. Quite the formula. Yeah. And both of them reached out to me. I think, I think when all my shit went down and over the next year, I think Maharaj Kar reached out to me and I think he did, though he had moved on. You know, so there were a handful of people, but you know, I was not interested in trying to carve out some role for myself as a gay Sikh within 3HO. I was like, no, this is, this is not a thing for me, you know? So these are the things that kept, you know, just kind of kept, um, oh, and here's another thing. So I spend a summer in Europe and I reconnect with Lori Bookie. B-O-U-C-K-E. She was Sakhar Tarkar. Her and her ex-husband, Sakhar Tar Singh, were sent to Amsterdam to start the ashram. And then they started the Golden Temple restaurant. And we just got together because, you know, we knew each other from the India trip. And she, both of us were out and I flew to Holland. I was in Europe. So I went to Holland and Amsterdam and stayed with them. It was real cool to see a city, you know, when you're traveling, it's really nice to see a city from an insider, you know, someone that lives there you know, can show you around, you can just hang out for a few days. And it just, you know, we were more interested in catching up on what are you doing now and blah, blah, blah. And she said, by the way, you know, she goes, my, my husband, she goes, my father donated a lot of money that we put into, and I forget if she said the ashram or the Golden Temple restaurant. She said, you know, we put that money into it and it was our investment. And we'd really like to get it back because that restaurant's doing really well. It was either the restaurant or the ashram, the building. I'm pretty sure it was the restaurant. She goes, do you remember the letter that went out in the late 70s, early 80s, stating that you had to put all enterprises into the name of, I was like, I just happened to remember that letter. Wow. They got to understand, I'm now like cut hair. You know, she goes, well, when you go back to LA, do you think you could go to the secretariat and find a copy of it? It might help us in our case. You're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, First of all, if you're a Sikh and you ring the doorbell there, maybe after five minutes, someone will answer through the double doors and go, yeah, what do you want? You know, it's just like, sorry, can't. But it was just that, Gurushan, it was just like that. Yes, I saw that letter. And that's the implications. The chancellors of the Dharma said to their brothers and sisters, your money, your hard work, your businesses and your investments are ours, not yours. They belong to your teacher. Fuck you. That's what that letter said. And I didn't see it at the time. And you can tell I get really riled now because that's the shit that went on in broad daylight and everyone supported it. Everyone awake enough to think about what they were reading and what they were signing over. And all I could tell her was, I'm sorry. So. Yeah. And I want to add to it that along with that came the mystical or mythical idea that these were family businesses that our children would inherit. 
that our children would own, that our children would reap the benefits of. Cooperative, we benefit, we grow. Oh, the idea of doing that was kind of like spun as a community concept that I remember hearing as like a great thing that it's owned by the community. There's a lot of benefits to having it like collectively owned and and, you know, again, growing up in community and conscious community kind of feeling like, oh, I can always work with a family business. And as we've heard, we haven't heard on this podcast yet, which I'm hoping um, more of the young people will share. But a lot of young people that grew up in the Dharma, like myself, that bought into that narrative that said, yes, that Yogi Bhajan told them specifically, if you work for this company, you'll take it over you'll reap the benefits. They didn't get their college degree. They didn't get education outside of Dharmic businesses. They didn't get any support, financial benefits, or ownership of these businesses. Did they even get vested interest over time? No. Did they really get their commissions when they were building up these brands? No. One of my dear friends had to leave. Through. One of my dear friends was in the process of leaving 3HO and realized the CBB was screwing her and her husband out of their commissions. They had to strategically over months salvage their relationships with the retailers that they worked with so that they could start their own business. And out of respect, they went to one back last meeting with Yogi Bhajan after 20 years in the ashram and he hit her, he slapped her. And she left the meeting, they looked at each other and said, we've been in a cult for 20 years. And again, I'm not passing on gossip. This is a dear friend of mine, it's her story to tell, I'm not naming her name, but I'm not, I wouldn't say this if it didn't happen to someone whose truth I absolutely vouch for, you know? So yeah, those businesses, like cooperative businesses are hard, but you know what, they can be done. Vested interest, I had vested interest in a bakery company I worked for for six years. Unfortunately, their stock never added up to anything, but that's what you do to get the best out of people. You pay them commission, yearly bonuses, vested stock. Did our family businesses have any of that? I'm sorry, but I was told point blank by a very high up person that the family of Yogi Bhajan has already put $5 million into legal fees fighting his will. So you don't think there's a lot of money that's controlled by a handful of people right now? The family businesses that none of these people, that's what they're fighting over. Your commissions, you know. Well, your, your hard work, your sweat and tears, your assets, your energy, all of ours, it's collective energy that has built the organizations and the assets of the organizations. Um, we could keep talking, but there's kind of two stories that are fairly important for me to tell. Um, one of them was, and if there's anything else you want to ask, please, I'm not trying to bring this to a close, but we've, I don't know how long we've been rambling. Um, I was in therapy in the mid nineties and, you know, I would refer, you know, about, you know, just therapy, right? Life, right? And I would refer to the ashram and my therapist would always say the cult. And I would say, well, no, it's based on a 500 year old religion. And we would agree to disagree. For some reason, one day when I said, blah, 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 the ashram, and she goes, the cult. And I go, it's not a cult. Mm. And she goes, she asked me two questions. Does it differ fundamentally from the country or culture of origin? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do we need to sit there and count the ways? you know, from Kundalini yoga to white turbans to communal living to even vegetarianism. A lot of Sikhs are vegetarian, but not all. A lot of them aren't. Yeah. And then she goes, and I looked at her and I go, yeah. And then she goes, and is it all held together by one charismatic person? Hmm. Again, this was mid nineties. He was still at his charismaticness, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I was in a cult. And without skipping a beat, she goes, and look where you found your passion for cooking and your life's work. Okay, that's the end of our time. We'll see you next week. <laughs> so she, she saw both sides. She wasn't trying to demonize the situation, the experience. She just wanted me to see it for what it was, the good and the bad, you know? 
And let's face it, every major religion grew an offshoot of one charismatic individual that disagreed with so-and-so and then Lutheranism and Mark, Martin Luther and the guy that founded Mormonism and Catholicism and Christianity and Congregationalists. I mean, everything's an offshoot of, I mean, we read about all the different types of, you know, Muslim. I mean, it's, yeah. where do you draw the line at cult? Well, and on that note, I just want to say to all those that are practicing an original form of Sikhi, um, you know, this is really illuminating cultural misappropriation at its finest and the white superiority, the spiritual superiority that got infused into our cultural upbringing of the speak arm of the Western Hemisphere branch of Sikhi, as, as it's come to be known, so to speak. Um, I didn't know that it had so much white superiority infused into it. I, I did know a lot of the narratives that we were told growing up that we had a special, like, I didn't understand why we practice Kundalini yoga or why we were vegetarians and Indians weren't or all these different things. And my ethos was really like, oh, we have a special knowledge that only we have. And I didn't know how much that was a mythological tale um, and how much he extracted the parts he wanted us to get and that it wasn't a full total a totality of of the expression of Sikh religion worldwide yeah I didn't know that until a year ago I mean and I also didn't seek it seek yeah. it out but yeah. I really didn't have that context so yeah. just pointing that out for anyone that's listening to this that has more to shed light on in this particular area. Your story is welcome here. Um, it became very clear to me that most religions are about the organization. They're not about the individual. Yeah. And he just started like early on ridding himself of people so that he could tighten up the organization. You know, when, when, when I hear about you know, that betrayal of, of Michael. I, I still wish somebody could tell me what happened to Rondas Carr. I understand she was relieved from her position after many years of service, devoted hard work and, and for being a lesbian. I don't know the truth there. Um, I, oh, I do need to tell one other story. I saw her at the Singkar Gurdwara, which was really crucial for me. I heard through the grapevine that there was going to be this Gurdwara. Gurdwara, what year oh. is this? You've already left. Sure. 1997. Car was a major musician. Her music yeah. is very iconic still. Yeah. If you've ever taken a Kundalini class, you've probably heard Singkar's music. Keep going. Yeah. My sister and I also passed through St. Louis, Missouri, or wherever they lived once, going back to see our parents. And her ashram was spotless, Singkar. This was in the late 70s. And you know my sister, she's very impeccable housekeeper. And she goes, how do you keep it so clean? And Singkar just looks at her and goes, years of training. <laughs> um, Singkar, Lorelei, I think she went by after she left Riacho, ethereal voice, brought the words of the Peace Lagoon to music played her guitar. You could see that she had that artist's struggle with her own talent, her muse. You know, it didn't just not like, oh, I'm going to play a guitar now. Like you could tell she sometimes was not in the mood. Other times she just grabbed it by the tail. But she was a true musician and a beautiful singer. I knew her a little bit. Um, like I said, I had stayed in her ashram. You know, when you go to the solstice in those days, you meet a lot of people. Another brilliant thing Yogi Bhajan said, solstice is silence. The one chance we all have to see people from all over the country and connect, we're not supposed to talk. This is so funny. I've never you thought of that. Control? Yes, please. Well, you're not corroborating stories. <laughs> exactly. So you don't know what anyone else is thinking. You're, nobody followed the side. We'd be, we'd whisper, you know, <laughs> silent. Oh. But that's how you'd meet people. That's how you'd connect. You finally see these people that are doing this thing that was seen as so bizarre back then. Anyway, so 1997, um, years out of 3HO, Monty's Bakery's happening. I hear about this Gurdwara. Singkar has cancer. She's clearly on her way out. She wants to have this Gurdwara. She doesn't live in LA. She wants to have, she wants to perform at Sunday Gurdwara. And she invites you know, anybody that's going to Gurdwara and of course all her ex-3HO friends. 
So a bunch of us dissent. Vikram, Pamela, formerly Premka, Ganga, Akasha, myself, um, Ravi Singh, I don't know if you knew him, Sita's son. That was a trip. I hadn't seen him since he was a little boy. And I know she, who he is, and I know who Sita is, yeah. yeah. Um, so Singhar is performing, and it's just, her, her voice is weak, but pure and beautiful. And then Yogi Bhajan comes out. And he sits down next to her. And he doesn't acknowledge her. He doesn't thank her for singing that day. He doesn't thank her for all her years of singing at solstice, for bringing the words of Peace Lagoon to life. In fact, he ignores her. Mm. I've looked for video. I'm pretty sure my memory is spot on. It was confirmed by Vikram, who said he was in exceptionally bad form that day, even for him. Um, he sits next to her and he doesn't acknowledge her or look at her. And somebody says, well, he can't see your aura if you're not wearing a turban. Well, how did he get students in the first place? That's what I've had people tell me that. You can't see your aura if you're not wearing a turban. Oh, that's convenient. And then he says something that the person next to me who'd never been around 3HO, he starts in this little spiel and he goes, everyone is God and everything is God. And some people all say I'm a bad man, but if I am a part of God and everything is part of God, how can I, how can God be bad? And again, I'm sorry if I'm doing a bad Indian accent. I, I mean, no disrespect. It's hard to think. And the person next to me leans over and he goes, that's the biggest justification I've ever heard. These are all people that have left already because they're critical. No, this is somebody who'd never seen him. Oh, I see. They're Even coming there as the partner of someone that was there and they were just like, what a crock of, you know. And I looked at him and I just saw him as a petty, hmm. petty, sad person. And I was done. I stopped having nightmares. I had the best nightmare I ever had of him was I was in the, I was in the estate, which I'd only been into once. And there's Kirtan in the backyard. This is the nightmare. This isn't the Gurdwara. And in the dream, I'm like crawling along the floor and I get to the couch and I can hear this Gurdwara and I lift my, to the top of the couch and there's a window and I lift my head up and there he is and he's staring at me. And I jump awake. Like I used to have those kind of dreams about him mm. for years after I left. That day, done. Done. Close oh. in a coffin. Yeah. Wow. So I just want to read with one last thing. Um, somebody in the first gen who's been in for many, many, many years reached out to me and they had questions about, you're referring to family businesses and things that happened in front of us. And this, is in the, this was in the Eugene or the Oregon Register Guard. I mean, I looked it up for this guy. It took me five minutes. <clears throat> so when people wonder about the things that happened in broad daylight. Yeah. It says, this is from the Oregon Register Guard. Golden Temple's roots is Golden Temple Foods in Oregon, which is, you know, gold, pea cereal. Golden Temple fills the bins of bulk cereal granolas all over the country. I think they were the partner for Yogi Tea. Golden Temple's roots date to 1972 when Cameron Healy, <clears throat> who later founded Kettle Chips and others living in a Eugene ashram dedicated to the teachings of Yogi Bhajan, launched a small bakery in Springfield. The founders donated Golden Temple to the Eugene Ashram, and over the years, it has provided jobs and financial support for the Yogi's Sikh community, as well as jobs and charitable, charitable support for the larger Eugene Springfield area. It is now a global business with 125 million in annual revenues. That was from 2010. Wow. So somebody who's devoted their life to this guy can't take five minutes, who sent his son to India, can't take five minutes to look up the truth of what their organization's based on. You can't make this shit up. Yeah. So. As we've heard before, sometimes the best way to hide the truth is to put it in plain sight. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank you. I want to thank a lot of the people that have gone on this podcast. And I got a, a, you know, kudos to Suzanne Jordan for holding the space with the Golden Cage page because it's, 
it's really helped me get in touch with the purity of the desire for a better world mm -hmm. and not to let our bad experience with him affect that and to reconnect with some of these people. You know, I'm fortunate enough that I connected with a lot of X3HO people, my whole Seattle family, you know, Nadine and her family and Sot and Richard and Andrea, I mean, and Akasha, like Prem, like there's deep, deep roots. But we never spent our time bitching about 3HO or Yogi Bhajan. We'd moved on, you know, our, our, our connection was real and together, same way it is with your family. But it's really sweet to reconnect with a larger group of people. And again, the other side of that coin is the people that were just effed over mercilessly, children that were abused and ignored in India, women that were abused. Like, how do you, how do you reconcile those two sides? I don't know, I don't have the answer. Yeah. But I, I thank you for this work, for bringing it, bringing it forward. Well, I want to thank you for your willingness to share so many stories. Um, I think that it's so valuable to revisit places that we think we've, quote, healed. Yeah. What we find is that scar tissue can make us functionable, yeah. but it, when we actually dive into the wound, we can actually unpack and shine light on places that we may never have actually like let ourselves feel. And that's what I feel so much from you over the last number of months, because we're family and we're more interpersonally connected. Um, I felt that like a dive you've taken to allow yourself to like examine wounds that you put into scar tissue land that you're like, oh, maybe I should look at the scab yeah. under there because there wasn't space to visit this stuff. There was an open conversation to visit this stuff. So suddenly we can talk about things we never talked about, look with a new lens at something we never saw before. And doing that with each other makes space we didn't have by ourselves. Well, and it's, and I want to point this out because I really respect Philip to sleep scholarly work researching those early days of those mystical yogi characters that we used to hear about but also it's the heart of Premka's book is what connects us to our experience. And a lot of the people that I just mentioned, they never really told me their story until the catalyst of, of, of Pamela's book. Wow. You know, although I did back in the nineties when, you know, Larry and Guru Marka, formerly of Detroit, they were both on that trip with Pamela and the main claim that her book opens up with when you know she's left behind in India at a hospital. London, yeah. They were like, oh, that makes sense because I remember one day she was fine and the next day we have to leave her there because she's got this flu. Again, I didn't know this till the 90s, but they validated what she later claimed in her book. And it's like, yeah, I heard that 15 years ago from two other sources that were there who were willing to now look back at the thing that they allowed themselves to just gloss over, yes. but it validated. So again, it was like Yogi Bhajan was that master manipulator staying one step ahead and people just kept seeing what he wanted them to see, you know? Yeah, and I wanna say that hearing each other's stories does that, it can validate places in ourselves that we've glossed over, swallowed or plain shut out that just by hearing another story can be like, oh, I remember I was on that trip. I remember that situation. And this is what really creates collective healing. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think you're really painting that for us. That something that was a story once, oh, I remember that. We, oh, and now you have a new lens on the same thing for the first time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I wish I had stood up more. Maybe Brahmdas Kar wouldn't have been treated badly. Maybe Miri Byland wouldn't have been so horribly abused. But I, you know, I'm fantasizing that, you know, that I would have had that strength to stand up to him or it would have made any difference. You know, when they tell me there's an LGBTQ booth today, these days, well, when solstice was happening, I just go, you know what? Not enough. Needs a much deeper, bigger reckoning. Sorry. Doesn't. It's, it's not a cat, it's not a, you know, something that somehow all, makes me feel all touchy feely, you know? Yeah, that's, that needs a much deeper dive.
So it's so interesting you're bringing that up because when I was at the European Yoga Festival the last couple of years, I brought that up to you. I was like, yeah, they got an LGBT, LGBTQ booth and who knew, right? And sure yet, they then still in the community, um, I'm hearing plenty of discrimination still. So I found that so fascinating that like this young yoga student movement might create these booths and yet still within kind of the heart of the community, right you know, gay and lesbian people cannot marry in their gurdwaras still yeah. and other things, even ostracization within the yoga culture, yeah. which is still asinine and astounding to me. Are, are you saying that in Europe at the yoga festival, there was a more LGBTQ presence? No, there was just a booth. Uh, I haven't been to Solstice, so same thing. Booth at Solstice, booth Well, at I heard there was at the Sat Nam Festival, there was an LGBT booth, maybe not at Solstice. But I'm you know what? At Solstice, but Sat Nam Fest was a totally different version, not run by the organizations. Right, right. Um, but I bring it up to say that right. oftentimes young yoga students will be so surprised at the lack of inclusion, and yet yes. the inner those of us that know anything about the culture of 3HO, we're not surprised at all. We're like, mm, yeah, long history of gay, lesbian yeah. ostracization and racism. You know, like we're pointing these things out. It says, why well, we got to talk about it? Because the machine of the teacher training is going to still paint any picture, quote, that's publicly accessible, but we need to share the stories that happen to real people every single day in our community, like yours and beyond. And you're bringing up something that's interesting because I discovered when I went on that tour that the further you were from LA, often the more people didn't care what the gossip was there. If they knew me as their friend, I was their friend, whereas in LA, I was an outcast. A um, couple years later, when I had left 3HO and cut my hair, <clears throat> I literally ran into Gurhan Singh and Gurhan's car. I think they're divorced now, but on the streets in Paris. And I was staying there for a few weeks. They couldn't have been nicer. We hung out. They could give a shit that I left or cut my hair, was eating this or that. Like they were just like they 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 were part of a community of, of people doing yoga and they weren't trying to adhere to some rigid, you know, but that was always the exception, not the rule. And we we always thumbed our noses up at that. But the closer we got to the inner circle, you know, there was only one way to do it. And the reality should have been all along that you leave yourself in the community where you live and the people in that community. But so there might have been people like that all along living their own thing, doing it more uniquely authentic to them. But to the powers that be, they were always probably kind of an outcast, you know? And on that note, so that means, yeah, the more remote places, obviously there was more independence, more free thought, the closer in to kind of like the organizational structure or hierarchy of things, the more rules and regulations. And I think that's to be said of all institutions, right? And, but yeah. it's important to keep in mind within our own organization, that's what leads to confusion of people's experiences. You could have a far remote experience and, and kind of take on the myth but not realize the amount of exclusion that was actually an ostracization that was actually taking place all along. Yeah, yeah. And yet I think everybody was aware of it on some level because people you loved were there and then suddenly not there anymore. Yeah, I often, I, I occasionally ask people, like especially the young kids, you know, that are now second gen, like, you know, Avtar, they, they just thought I left and wanted to go open this bakery. They didn't know, oh, there were actually three or four years in between there where all this shit went down. And I, you know, I, it was never my place to bring it up. But now with the communication through social media, people can read about what was happening in their family and their religion, you know? I mean, one of the best times I ever had was when I got to Española for Mangala's wedding. And that was 2000. That was a week after 9-11. Talk about a yatra just getting a plane to fly off the ground after 9-11 and, and get to, you know, my plane, my luggage got left in Salt Lake, but I mean, it felt so good to be there. Wow. You know, it felt, I didn't go up to Ramdas Puri and I didn't see Yogi Bhajan, which was great. But, and then the second gen, Ravi Kar, she couldn't have been nicer. Some of my old friends, people that I went to India with, they're like, oh, Satnam. now? But the second gen were like, oh, you know, totally embracing. Like they never, 
they always kind of like rolled with whatever their friends did when they got back from India, whether they stayed hardcore Sikh or were going to raves all night. Like they just embraced their, their brothers and sisters. And I remember just seeing, you know, not everyone was like that. There was this one woman that really bugged me that I had been friends with, I went to India with, and she just didn't have time for me. Um, but the other people were delightful. The Gurdwara was beautiful, the ceremony, just to be there. And of course, to go to all our favorite old Mexican restaurants and maybe have a margarita with dinner. <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe there was some chicken broth or more on the sopapilla this time, if you're not a vegetarian, if that's okay. But yeah, no, it's, it felt great to be back there. And it felt, felt great to be back there in my full self and seeing everybody and participating in a ceremony and, you know, the Gurdwara, it, it was awesome. I loved it. So what I hear you saying, though, is that some of your old Sikh friends wouldn't talk to you, kind of give you like a, a standoffish satnam, but a lot of the second gen, the younger generations were very open and inclusive. And I think that's really reflective of the generations, too, that as young people, if our friends cut our cut their hair, we were still like, we love you no matter what, but that wasn't necessarily the case from first gens, that it was very distinct if yeah. somebody judged you, if you yeah. cut your hair had left, you could feel it just in the energy of it. And then those who didn't were very inclusive and welcoming no matter what. Right, yeah. And for life, for, for people that have been involved for 20, 30, 40 years, like, didn't it get tired? Didn't you get tired of having to love someone as your brother and sister one day and then, oh, they freaked out, they left, they're going to hell. Really you know, shocked yeah, didn't, weren't they curious about, uh, you know, uh, Wagaru Singh and Carr and Ganga and Vikram and all these people that really put their heart and soul into the early days. Then, oh, you know, maybe when the hippie haze wore off in the 70s, by the 80s and 90s, didn't they ever have a critical, that, that's my big thing, like open up, talk to the people, look at what's happening right in front of you, talk to the people, listen to their story. You know, one of my friend's sons at Khalsa Council 1990 stood up and said, if your children come back from India and tell you what's happening there, listen to them. And the outcome of that was no more kids allowed to talk at Khalsa Council. Wow. You know? So how many decades can people go on with that willful blindness and that willful ability to just believe the worst of the people that the week before were cooking, cleaning, serving, grooming, chanting, you know, doing all the things to make the community what it is. Yeah, it is. It's quite mind blowing because I think of that too, you know, major, major staples of various different ashrams left, whether it's Wagyu Singh and Kar and Vikram and, and I mean, just on and on at different stages. And when these massive groups leave that were like dedicated, devoted yogis and Sikhs and all the things, and yet they were just in the category, oh, they lost the way. And yeah. the fact that that narrative was so powerful to keep people still only focus on their experience and yeah. not the fact that there could be collective abuses taking place really illuminates the high controlled cult aspect of our, of our upbringing. Yeah. Thank you. We yes, really thank you. Yourself. I don't know how long we went. Oh my yeah. God. We're, we're, we're 20 minutes away from three hours here, so <laughs> no, I um, go ahead and ask, is there anything more before we go into the song part? No, is there anything no. you really want to highlight here before we wrap up your personal story? No, I think I pretty much covered everything. Wow, I can't believe how long we talked. I figured we would. Um, I love you. I love spending time with you. Love I, you. I still have other people's, you know, stories to hear. Um, okay, this song, wow. This song was Jimmy Somerville, who was in uh, Bronski Beat and the Communards. He goes back to the 80s. I mean, I started listening to, you know, new wave music in the 80s. And this guy's voice is amazing. And he straddled, you know, new wave radio hits, you know, Dur new wave, you know, Duran Duran, you know, Adam Ant, you know, Thomas Dolby, you know, all the big, you know, players, Human League. Uh, Bananarama, all that. Um, gay discos, straight discos. I mean, this guy's got pipes, you know. And this song, Small Town Boy, it's about love and loss. And sometimes people maybe around you don't understand, or maybe you don't understand, but you know you've got to move on. And 
back then it, you can you can play you can find the disco version and it's awesome and his voice is clear and it's more of a like you just hit the dance floor but like a lot of 80s stars when they go back and do their iconic hits they often do a macapella and i was blown away i knew this had to be my song and so many other people have had very spiritual songs i was like nope we're going for a dance song when i went to look for it he recorded this in 2014 wow. so it's 30 years later He's still got the pipes and oh, and he bucked all the trends. He's been openly gay his entire career. Love you know, it. Major pop star with two major bands to a solo career, to solo hits to, yeah. And he, you know, he's did this 30 years after it was a hit and it's just, yeah, it's still, it still gets me. So I hope you're able to find it on the only version I could find. No, well, I, I, I just took the link that you sent. So I'll, I'll share that one. I just want to um, say thank you for being who you are and for being courageous enough to just become you, you know, all these years staying connected. I know you stayed connected to our family when we were still active Sikhs in the community for many years. And just that, that intentional, I don't want to be ostracized completely. I need yeah. to make sure to maintain that connection. But the courage it takes to revisit all this and to share yourself here and to share stories that may be uncomfortable, all of this is just so valuable and I know sheds light for a lot of listeners. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so for copyright purposes, we won't be playing the fullness of this song, but you can subscribe to um, the Spotify, Spotify playlist, which is the Uncomfortable Conversation Spotify playlist. And um, you can also donate to this broadcast um, by going to gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations if you'd like to make a one-time or monthly donation to support this broadcast. Let's go ahead and listen to the selected song of Mani here. And we will go from there. Okay, here we go. Thank you so much for being on our episode today, Monty Nile. You're welcome. This has been another Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I want to thank my guest, Monty Nile. This concludes this episode. And again, if you'd like to make a donation to this broadcast, you can do that at grunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, please send me an email to gn at gurunashan.com. Please be sure to check out the spelling of my name as it does has a, have a C, Guru Nishan, and don't want you to mess that one up. If you want to follow me outside of this podcast, you can check me out on all platforms at Guru Nishan and subscribe and support my work of creative truth telling at gurunishan.com. Thanks so much for tuning in.